If everyone could stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. And now can I have roll call, please? Ken Nelson. Here. Linda Gray. Here. Charles Ladd. He's here. he's here. Okay, he's here. Mary Scott. Absent. Virginia Higley. She's she's here. I can see her. All right. She's Frank, here. Frank Alimi. Here. John Piccinella. I think I seen John. There he is. Yep. I see him. Okay. Dane Thoroughgood. Vinny Grillo. Here. Yeah, Richard, he's back in here. Okay. John, can you hear us? John Petronella? I don't know. I, don't know I saw hear. that he joined us. I don't know if he's still there. There's feedback coming from somebody. John? I'm gonna text him real quick. I just, I don't think he can hear us. Can you hear me, Ken? I can hear you, yes. Okay. <laughs> I got invited so I can stay. <laughs> okay. Moving on, sorry about that. Can I get a motion for the approval of minutes for July 23rd, 2020? So moved. So moved. Oh. Second. <clears throat> Motions made and seconded. Any corrections or alterations that you would like to add? No, didn't see any. Seeing none, I'll accept a motion to approve. I so make moved. a motion that we approve the minutes of July 23rd's uh, meeting. And a second. Charlie. Second, Charlie. Motion's made and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All in favor, none against. Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Are you going to seize anybody? I was just going to do it right now. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, is John? I think we lost him. John Petronella, are you here? He's gone. Yeah, he's gone. Okay, I'd like to see alternate Vinnie Grillo for the following public hearings. And then moving on. Uh, new public hearing, PH 2979. Is there anyone here from 2539 Hazard Avenue? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? It's Dave Zyax. Yep, go ahead, Dave. Tell us what you'd like. I'm going to take the roll. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Ken Nelson? Here. Linda DeGray? Here. Charles Ladd? Here. Virginia Higley? She's here. I see her. Right. Yep. Yeah, she's waving. So she's Frank here. Alimo. Here. Here. John Petronella. Is he back yet? No, nope, I don't see him. Vinny Grillo. Here. And Richard Suzak is here. Okay, John Petronella just texted me back. He's trying to reboot reboot because he had no audio. Okay, sorry about that, Dave. Go ahead. No Tell problem. us a little bit about what you'd like to do. Yes, um, we're over at uh, Enfield Commons, and uh, I'm going to go. I, I think I can share this now. Are you 
too short. Let's see here. Got too many things open. How about that? Can you guys see that? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're over at the Enfield Commons. Uh, this is for a special permit site plan and a uh, flood hazard application. Uh, the proposal is to, if we go over here to the slide number two, this is the uh, layout plan. And um, you can see this is the overall infield commons down at the bottom is Hazard Avenue. Off to the right hand side is Freshwater Boulevard. This is the main building and then we have our out, out parcels along Hazard Avenue. This is Olive Garden way over to the east side, way over to the right side. And then there's the restaurant that's been uh, vacant now for a while that's in the center. I was thinking about this, you know, uh, I actually did the site plan back in the late 80s or early 90s, I can't remember, when we did the Olive Garden and what was Red Lobster. This building was originally a Red Lobster restaurant. And uh, the Red Lobster closed a couple of years later and then it's been a, a series of restaurants over the years. And uh, the proposal is to uh, demolish that building and replace it with a new uh, building. Uh, they've tried for many years to try to find a, a restaurant that would take that space back and then possibly convert it over to some retail space. And it, it just doesn't work economically to try to save the building. So this proposal is to demolish that building and replace it. Looking here at uh, this uh, colored rendering here, you can see over here is the Olive Garden, then Ocean State job lot store, and then the Aspen Dental that opened a few years ago. And this new building would be put in the same location. It actually is a little smaller than the existing restaurant there. The existing restaurant's around 8,500 square feet. This building would be just under 7,000 square feet, be 6,986. It's designed to accommodate three tenants. Um, as you know, these out parcels do not have direct access to Hazard Avenue. The only way to access them is through the, the shopping center circulation. Uh, there will be no change to the shopping center access. In this rendering, you see the, the gray color is the area that would be the, uh, the limits of work. As part of the demolition, there'll be some of the parking lot will be reconfigured. Um, as part of this, there will be the introduction of a drive-through uh, which would start over here on the east side of the, of the work area and then wrap around the building. The drive-through would be over here on the west side of the building. And the tenants for this building right now, we have uh, Starbucks would be on the west end. Uh, Jersey Mike's Sandwich Shop would be over on the east uh, side. And there's a third tenant space in the middle that has not been uh, identified yet, but that would not uh, in all probability be a restaurant. It'd it be a, either a service industry or a, a small retailer located in the center. So basically, um, uh, again, you, you, the drive-through would operate counterclockwise. You'd enter here, come out over here. Very similar to what was uh, constructed over at uh, Panera Bread. Uh, we've provided a little bailout lane up here at the north end. So in case you're in line and uh, you find out you're in the wrong line or you panic and whatever, you forgot your wallet, you can you can leave the line. The menu would be here in the back of the building. So that's where you would actually order the um, uh, food from uh, food and coffee from Starbucks. And you'd come around, the window would be over here. We widen this lane to 20 feet on this side. So again, if for some reason you find yourself in the drive through lane and you don't want to be there, you can bail out and go around the cars waiting and come out at this location here at a stop bar. The loading and dumpsters would be a shared area here behind Ocean State, very similar to what's behind the restaurant right now. Um, you might find in your pot, a packet there was a letter back and forth with Ocean State Joblet. There's actually two letters. Initially, Ocean State had some concerns about, um, you know, <laughs> coordinating in the back there where the loading area and dumpster areas would be. We worked closely with them for a couple of months. And uh, this revised plan um, is a result of those discussions. And you have a new letter in your packet that uh, indicates that Ocean State no longer has any concerns with the operation as, as proposed. We are proposing some outdoor dining locations that would be here on the south side of the building on the Hazard Avenue side. There'd be one over here on the left side for Starbucks and one over here on the right side for uh, 
the Jersey Max. In the center will be a you know, sidewalk paved area for uh, you know access to all three tenants. So there, as far as the layout goes, there will be no changes um, to uh, the Olive Garden parking as you see it now. There will be some changes over here on the left side or the right side rather of Aspen Dental. If you're uh, familiar with this at all, um, you know that the, the parking on that side over there is a little strange in that it's angled parking. And uh, there's currently a driveway that loops around the side of this existing building and then exits out into that loading area behind Ocean State and behind that restaurant. Well, that driveway will be demolished and removed and the parking area next to uh, Aspen will be reconfigured in a conventional fashion with you know, 90 degree parking and a separation from the drive through the new drive through Looking at the, uh, the layout plan, sheet LA1 that was in your package, you can see all the details. Uh, what we do have is um, handicap, new handicapped parking spaces that'll be located in the center of the new building. Uh, there will be sidewalks. We'll be tying into the sidewalk in front of uh, Olive Garden that will cut through the front, the face of this building and then tie into the sidewalk system that's in front of Aspen Dental and that continues on. There'll be a sidewalk continuation from uh, the front of the building to the back of the building along the drive through It ties into the access points to the Olive Garden. And then we have a, uh, an established walkway here to allow patrons to gain access to all that parking behind Olive Garden uh, if that's necessary. Anyone loading uh, you know, for the new building will be able to use that access sidewalk. And behind the building is a, um, a series of ramps and landing areas for the loading areas behind this building. Uh, they all meet uh, ADA requirements. As far as site lighting goes, there's very little change. We're just going to have to move this one light standard here that illuminates Aspen's lighting here. And then uh, there's lighting already out in this parking area uh, in front of the building. And we'll have uh, wall sconces, as you'll see on the architectural plan, that'll go around the entrance doors in the back and in the front that will provide adequate lighting for you know, pedestrians and uh, for security. Uh, those are decorative wall sconces that will be part of the architecture. Very quickly, looking at the landscaping, uh, we are uh, removing two uh, trees that were planted as part of the, the construction in the front. We're replacing those. And then we are uh, landscaping all the islands and uh, around the foundation of the building will be all landscaped as well. And then there's some um, buffer landscaping around the dumpster pad in the back. <laughs> the dumpster will have a, a panel fence around it anyhow, but we've added some additional uh, landscaping around that. Uh, there'll be no change to the mature landscaping that is currently along Hazard Avenue now, as you see it uh, <clears throat> as you drive by. Uh, if we take a quick look at the, the overall master plan that's in your package as well, um, up in the corner, right, left-hand corner of that plan. It always does that. Um, is the um, zoning data table. It broke down, you know, all the, all the requirements and the parking information. Um, this shopping center is somewhat non-conforming um, since it was remodeled back in the early 90s and that uh, it doesn't meet, um, like for instance, it doesn't meet the minimum interior landscaping requirements, you know, throughout the entire center. Uh, the way these, these uh, shopping centers have always been handled is the intent is to, every time you make an improvement, is to bring it closer and closer to conformity. Uh, and this does that uh, in that the impervious coverage on the site is actually dropping a bit from 71.9 down to 71.5. The shopping center has a variance, a long-standing variance for 72%. So, uh, you know, again, we're showing some positive improvement there and, and adding some additional uh, green space to the, pro to the overall site. The, uh, the project will meet the overall parking requirements with no variances or anything uh, necessary. I think you're about 
required is around 1300 and something spaces and we have a little bit over 1400 parking spaces still on the site with the changes. So uh, we meet the parking requirements and uh, the coverages are heading in the right direction as far as improving upon the uh, existing non-conformities. Uh, there'll be only very minor drainage system changes um, around the building just to accommodate the new layout. It will remain connected to the public water and sanitary sewer. We have grease traps uh, for the two restaurants. I think from an overall traffic point of view, there's really no change. The access will be as it uh, presently is from both freshwater and hazard. The only way to gain access to the, uh, dry, the new drive-through will be internally. So any kind of backup issues and everything will not present any uh, uh, you know, change to traffic patterns or levels of service to uh, the outside traveling public around the shopping center. As far as the flood hazard permit goes, uh, very little uh, change. Uh, because of the grading changes, we do lose a little bit of flood storage capacity in the back of the building. Uh, the flood elevation here is about 114. So almost about 85% of the shopping center is within that elevation. So every time you do anything on the site, you have to deal with flood compensation. And the way we're handling that is with a little bit of underground storage chambers uh, underneath our new pavement. It's a pretty typical approach to dealing with that issue. And that's been reviewed by your town engineer and you have his comments. His only comment was to make sure the system was waterproof, which we will definitely do. But the, the end result is there will be no uh, impact to the flood storage capacity um, of the brook, it's freshwater brook. And at this time, what I'd like to do is uh, have uh, Wesley Creech from NI Design. They're the architects, the project architects. And I have some slides for him. This is the basic footprint that shows the three tenant spaces and maybe Wesley, you could take over. Is Wesley there? Wesley? Wesley, we can't hear you, but we can see you trying to speak. You are unmuted on my end. I wonder if he's having the same problems John had. John is back on, by the way. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. I was having a difficult time getting audio. Is this uh, working? Oh, there you go. All right. Sorry about go. that. So I <laughs> was trying to say the floor plan is fairly uh, preliminary and fairly basic, but it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, on the right-hand side, though, is the Hazard Avenue front uh, facades, and at the rear is on the left-hand side. Um, the, there is a small one, uh, one story, well, the whole building is one story, but there's a short one story, 140 square foot utility room at the rear for uh, the sub, uh, the tenant utilities and sub panels um, to connect to there at that point. Um, the, if you wanna go to the next slide, Dave, um, the, Exterior, um, you know, fairly simple, but tried to give each, as the building is designed for three separate tenants, give them all a little uh, personality of their own. The left-hand side is the Starbucks uh, facade, and the far right-hand side is the Jersey Mike's um, with the to-be-determined tenant in the middle. Um, the Starbucks, well, the Starbucks and the Jersey Mike's, there's just, uh, some stone veneer, uh, on the corners going in a little faux beam, wood beam across the top of each one of the storefronts and a metal canopy, um, for each tenant. Um, 
there's vertical gray siding for the Starbucks side and EFIS is pretty much the rest of the building, just different colors, as you can see. Um, they, we do have, there is a parapet, the roof is at 17 feet and the short parapet at the front and the rear and along part of the side is a four foot high parapet. Um, and then at the corners, um, extending up to about seven feet above the roof line, all with the intent to help shroud the uh, HVAC equipment up above on the roof. Um, although, if there is need for additional, uh, that can be revisited. This here, Wesley, these are the side elevations. Maybe this is the drive through. Yeah, that's the drive through there for Starbucks. I, they're not on this color version on the black and white version. There are sconces that run along the Starbucks uh, drive through portion that whole section of the wall, there's four, three of, four of them spread out to give some illumination in the drive-through lane. As far as the signage goes, um, the plan is to meet the, the town's uh, regulations for signage, it's very specific, and uh, they'll be back in with the, with the specific signs for the three tenants um, for, for approval with the town. Um, at this point, we'd, we're just showing sort of areas reserved for those, uh, but we're not asking for signage improvement tonight. We'll, they'll come back in separate for that. Uh, one thing I just wanted to point out over here, I skipped over a little bit on the landscaping plan, is right now there's a lot of nice landscaping along the west side of Olive Garden. There's some nice ornamental trees along there where there's a, currently a sidewalk. We're going to maintain all that. So as you're walking along that sidewalk between our new building and uh, Olive Garden, it'll it'll have the same feeling to it as it does now. There'll be nice, some nice landscaping there. As far as uh, the uh, staff reports go, we've read the staff uh, memo to the commission and uh, we have no concerns with any of their comments for either the floodplain or the special use uh, site plan. Um, there's a few minor comments still floating around from staff, which planning staff is incorporated into the motion, and uh, we can easily address those, uh, you know, prior to filing the final plans. Um, and I think that concludes our presentation, uh, other than certainly answering any questions the commission might have. Commissioners? Mr. Chair? Go ahead, Rich. Because in, in terms of your seating areas, you know, I, I looked at the elevations. Are they going to be a raised ceiling area so that they're going to be a little higher than the sidewalk, or are they going to be flush with the sidewalk? No, they're going to be the same elevation as the sidewalk. They, they'll have a, uh, a, a painted metal, uh, you know, aluminized picket fencing around them to, to um, separate them from the sidewalk, but everything here is the same elevation. Because I know we had some concern when if somebody ever has a, a heavy foot on a, on a gas pedal and you know there's parking you know adjacent to where the seating areas are, we 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 have some concern that you know somebody might go through, you know up the curb and into you know a railing system that isn't protected or doesn't have any kind of you know bollard system that would prevent you know some car from you know getting into the seating area in terms of. You know, if there was another, you know, curb or cut or, or raised platform, then that would sort of prevent that from happening possibly. But I'm not sure what, you know, what your intentions are for that. Well, I mean, if we look at, if we march across, I mean, over here on the east side, we have an, a landscaped dial and sort of protecting Jersey Max, Jersey Mike's rather. Mm -hmm. Then we have two handicapped parking spaces and both of those have bollards with signs on them. So I guess uh, to address your concerns where um, Starbucks area is, we could probably incorporate some black metal bollards in with the fence, you know, rather than just single fence posts, we could put a couple of uh, 
across correctly. there. You know? And I think that's what, what we normally have had, you know, other applicants do in terms of incorporate a bollard system into their fencing, you know, post. Yeah. Right? yeah, I'm sure we could easily do that. I don't see where that's a big problem. Okay, I think that, that answers my question. Any other commissioner's comments? I have a question, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Alimo. Yeah, on the on a grease trap, uh, it looks like there's a thousand gallon grease trap going in. Um, are all the you all the um, uses um, each individual tenant going to be connected to that? Uh, and obviously, there's two food establishments now. Yeah. But um, just for that middle space, should it uh, become one, mm -hmm. uh, will that have the capacity, or and it will will it be connected? Yeah, because actually what we have right now is there's a grease trap that is currently installed what what, what will be underneath our new drive through here on the west side. Okay. That's what the, re the existing restaurant used. So our plan is to connect Starbucks to that one. Okay. Even okay. though technically Starbucks probably doesn't need a grease trap because they really don't prepare very much food there. Okay. Uh, but we're going to connect them there anyhow. And then... Um, on the Jersey Mike side, we're going to put a brand new grease trap in underneath what will be our new drive through as well. Another thousand. Uh, Correct. That's what I think I'm yeah. seeing the, snap, the staff. Yeah. Now. So there will be two grease traps. And if the third tent, it really, the intent is from what I understand from Paramount is to really not put a third restaurant here. Um, but if there is one, then we'll connect them either into the one on either side because mm -hmm. they're, both, they're both oversized for the Jersey Max doesn't generate a lot of grease either. Okay. Jersey Mike's. I keep calling it Jersey Max, but it's Jersey Mike's. Well, I was just thinking maybe, you know, a future provision, a stub up, if you would, or, you know, something where they can access uh, that uh, line. Yeah. So we don't internal, have to dig in the up internal up plumbing. Dig up. Yeah, yeah. So you don't have to come back and dig up the sidewalk or the roadway or any right. of that where, um, you know, they would easily be able to just uh, uncap something and, and access that uh, grease trap if needed. Yeah. Yeah, we'll definitely we'll we'll uh, we'll get that look at there. We'll get and, that incorporated in the MEP stuff. Okay, and I like the improvements. Just comment for me. I like the improvements what you're doing between uh, Aspen Dental there. Um, that's a little crazy the way that. <laughs> that that was always intended to be another drive-through. I can remember in the back of my mind, and that never happened. It so it ended up kind of weird. Yeah, it is weird. I like I like the the change there. Um, uh, on the, the drainage, you're talking about the, uh, for your new drainage about the concrete about the pipe. Yeah. Um, they did. What's the comment about wrapping it in, uh, in reinforced concrete? I think. Uh, yeah, there was a couple of comments. Eight inches, the 400 psi test done to it. Yeah, that's part of the notes. That's that's part of the uh, staff notes. Yeah, the uh, the town engineer had a couple of comments. We don't have any problems with those. We'll accommodate those in the final plan. Okay. All right. Yeah, I just noticed that uh, after you had talked about that. Uh, yeah. That's me. Yeah, I, I see they want some concrete uh, around it, eight yeah. inch. Uh, uh, yeah, and they wanted to make sure they were waterproof gaskets and things yeah. of that nature. So yeah. we'll, we'll deal with that. Okay. That's it for me, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, the only only concern I would have is people have used that um, previous exit through the back of the building as a shortcut for years and years and years. They know it's there. Um, are you going to do a little additional signage so people don't drive backwards through that drive through thinking, you know, that that's still an exit out of there? Yeah, we've got, um, if we go over to... Uh... LA1, you can see we've got uh, do not enter signs with the two stop signs at the yeah. end of the drive through. Um, so uh, I suppose we could, we could probably put something like no outlet signs or something on uh, the Aspen parking because that's dead ended, you know? Uh, yeah. I, I can understand what you're saying. So we'll take a look at that. Maybe we can put a couple of uh, no outlet signs over there or something like that. Right. Just old habits are hard to break. Yeah, you're especially in the beginning, you know. Uh, yeah. I can understand that, sure. Yeah, we'll figure something out. And then um, another thing is, I was looking at the entire plaza, and it seems to be very 
unfriendly to pedestrians. There is a sidewalk along 190. There is not one along the side of the plaza, but there are no sidewalks actually leading from the town sidewalks into your plaza. People would have to walk down the driveways um, on, on the uh, east side and on Hazard Avenue. You know, have you ever thought about adding, you know, like little sidewalks to, you know, like to go into Red Robin or to go into this new building here so people don't have to walk down the main driveways? That's a good point, actually. Um... Because there's none. We could discuss Not that. We could discuss that with uh, Paramount and see whether we can introduce a couple of short sidewalks in logical locations. You know, I, you know, just breaking through. You know, small through the tree belt or something, just to get you yeah. access. So you're not because those driveways are very busy, which is good for you guys. But you know, pedestrians walking down there, I just don't see it as safe. Right. No, I, I would not endorse having pedestrians walk down these two main driveways off of Hazard Avenue. That's for sure. They're, uh, they're pretty heavy. Right. Yeah, I would say that's definitely something we could work with Paramount on and find, you know, a couple of places. I mean, they're like, you're, you're talking about a 15 or 20 foot long sidewalk is all you're talking about, you know. To, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's more just for the, you know, like I said, the people walking up and down Hazard Avenue, which seems to be more and more. It just makes it more pedestrian friendly, I think. Yeah. We could other definitely than, take a look at that. Yeah. You know, other than that, I just had a question about the grease traps, which you've already answered. So thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have one also, Ken. Go ahead, Commissioner Ladd. Uh, I noticed on the first drawing you showed us, it doesn't look like you can drive through from Olive Garden to the front of this plaza. There's a trees or blockage here now. Oh no, that's just on the photo. This this is a this 24 foot lane goes all the way across Olive Garden in our new building. Okay, there's no that's good. There's no interruption there. All right, it just looks like there is. <laughs> yeah, well, that's because that's a big tree there now. I, oh, okay. I planted that tree 30 years ago. It's gotten pretty big. You did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Sure. And that is not one of the trees you're taking out, correct? No, there'll be no changes to the frontage along Hazard Avenue at all. Okay. All right, any other commissioner's comments before I open it up to the public? Seeing none, at this time, I would like to open public hearing 2979, 25, and 39 Hazard Avenue to the public going for the first time. Questions, comments, concerns, uh, please speak up. It's hard for me to see people raising their hand, but um, if you have any, please. Jen, did you have a question? I see your hands up. Um, yeah, I did have a question, or not a question really, but um, I know that um, Scott Ellis had wanted to be on this call. I don't see him on, but he did forward me comments regarding this application that I can read into the record um, whenever uh, you want me to do that. Okay, let me deal with the public first and then we'll go to you. Thanks, Jen, sorry about that. I didn't see your hand. Okay, at this time, is there anybody in the public who would like to speak uh, in regards to public hearing 2979 going for the first time? Anyone speak up going for the second time? Public hearing 2979, 25 and 39 Hazard Avenue going for the third time. Please speak up if you would like to talk. Okay, seeing none, um, at this point, go ahead, Jen. All right, so I received these um, late in the day on Friday, um, but he says, uh, it's Scott Ellis Fire Marshal says, I only, uh, I do have a few initial site issues. The first is that no natural slash combustible material will be allowed for landscaping around the building. Um, they have mulch listed. It must be stone or crushed brick or other non-combustible material. Also excluded are shredded recycled materials such as tires and the like. Further, I've been reviewing the entire site, including Ocean State job lot. At some point in time prior to my appointment, the marked and signed fire lane in front of Ocean State job lot was ignored 
and parking spaces striped and put into use. The signage still remains in place. I am assuming this has been in place for at least 10 years. While this is not directly associated with 39-41 Hazard Ave, it does affect access overall. Further, there's a peer, there appears to be a tractor-drawn trailer unit behind Ocean State Job that is being used as a permanent site pool for the um, entire 25 to 39-41 Hazard Avenue Plaza. To be clear, the issues associated with Ocean State Job Lot do not affect my approval of the 39 to 41 project. I wish to make this hearing platform to inform the plaza owners that these issues will need to be addressed and rectified. Thank you, Jen. Yep. Uh, Dave, would you like to address that? Uh, as far as the landscaping um, issues, that we can certainly accommodate that. Uh, you know, we just uh, swap out the bark mulch around the foundations of the building and go with, uh, sounds like a decorative stone will be acceptable, that's, that's fine. Um, and then the fire lane issues, we'll certainly work with the fire marshal. I'm sure during the building permit process, that's gonna pop up again. Um, I'm just trying to visualize where he's talking about. I can sort of, but it doesn't sound like it affects our layout at all. It just sounds like something that Paramount, Ocean State and, and, uh, and Paramount, since this is a Paramount building too, Paramount and Ocean State are going to have to deal with, uh, you know, a, one or two more of his comments there that sound like they're more of a uh, long-standing issue that need, just needs to be, you know, cleaned up. So we'll work, we'll work together on that. We'll straighten it out. Okay, commissioners, any other comments? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Commissioner Alimo. I think uh, Fire Marshal Ellis is talking about a fire lane that would be or supposed to be um, right on the west side of ocean state that which what you would call the front of it i think by his comments that's what he's talking about but again nothing to do really with this application but just just for a point of well i believe it has a lot to do with this application because it's fire safety for the entire plaza and access for the fire trucks so um we're not actually dealing with the tenant in this particular case we're dealing with the owners of the plaza and this issue needs to be addressed. So I would request that we make it a condition of approval that these fire lines are uh, corrected immediately um, to the satisfaction of the fire marshal. I don't think Dave has an issue with it, but I would definitely think we should need to make it a condition since it's been an ongoing problem. Well, if we could do that as part of this application, that would be great. I thought the way uh, the fire marshal's comments were that we were gonna have to go back and address that later, but if we could make that part of this, that would be awesome. Well, because it's an internal lot also. Right. So everything flows through the center of this plaza. It's not like it's got direct access access only to Hazard Avenue. Correct. Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about? The west side there, the, the, what you would think of as of the front of Ocean yeah. State. That probably yeah, was an established fire lane at one point, and now they park there and it's striped. Hmm. Well, we're going to have to work with it one way or the other with the fire marshal because uh, uh, that's just the process. So, you know, it is. Deal, deal with the uh, the commission should deal with that appropriately. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Any other co comments or questions from the commission? Hearing none at this time, I'd like to open it up to the public again. Um, is there anybody who would like to speak? With questions, comments, or concerns on public hearing 2979. If so, please speak up. Going for the first time. Going for the second time. And going for the third time. Okay, seeing none at this time, I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. I make a motion, Mr. Chairman, that we close the public hearing. Um, PH 2979, 25 through 39 Hazard Avenue. Motion's second. made, is there, and the motion seconded. Who seconded for the record, please? Linda. Linda, motion's made and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Oppo opposed? <clears throat> Unanimous. 
Okay, commissioners, how would you like to proceed? Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve the um, draft, draft resolution for public hearing 2979, um, dated July 23rd, 2020, as prepared by the planning department with the original initial 28 total conditions listed. There are three site specific conditions, but I believe we're gonna be adding approximately four more. And those four additional site specific conditions are going to be to incorporate bowlers into the railing system in a proposed seating area. Another one is to provide signage for the drive through control so that we don't have random cars going in the wrong direction. The third one would be sidewalks to connect the retail areas um, that are along you know, the, the area being developed with the Hazard Avenue sidewalk system. And a fourth one would be to include the comments of the fire marshal, including fire lane and you know, non-combustible materials around the building. Motions made, is there a second? Second, Linda. Motions made and seconded. Comments or concerns, questions? Seeing none, roll call please. Um, Linda DeGray. Four. Charles Ladd. Charlie's four. Virginia Higley. Okay, <laughs> Frank Alimo. Four. Um, Vinny Grillo. Four. Richard Suzak is four. And Mr. Ken Nelson, Commissioner Ken Nelson. Four. All in favor? None against? It passes. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of uh, August. You too. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay, move, moving on. Public hearing 2980. Uh, Roll call, please. Ken Nelson. Here. Linda DeGray. Here. Charles Ladd. Here. Virginia Higley. He's here. Francis yeah, Frank Alimo. Here. John Petronella. Here. Vinny Grillo. Here. And Richard Suzak is here. Okay. Is there anyone here who would like to speak on behalf of the applicant? If so, say your name and address for the record. I'm, my name is, everybody hear me okay? Yep. Hi, my name is Jeff Ford, professional engineer in the state of Connecticut with Bowler Engineering located at 16 Old Ford Road in Rocky Hill, Connecticut. So just give me one second here and try to pull up our presentation and share this with you guys. You guys see the screen okay? Yep. All right. So I'm here this evening on behalf of Kaplan Development Group, LLC, for a project located at 118 Hazard Avenue. Uh, I did want to start by thanking each and every one. We appreciate your efforts in scheduling this special meeting. Um, thank you very much. Uh, here with me this evening, Ben Wells of Kaplan Development Group and Stephen Humphreys of EDA Architects, who you'll hear from in a little bit. Provide you a little bit of history on, on how we got to where we are today. Uh, we previously attended earlier last year um, the applications review team meeting with town staff to discuss some, some issues with engineering and planning and zoning uh, that we went through, incorporated some of those changes into our design application to inland wetlands. Uh, in, in the first step, we also went to inland wetlands for a wetland map amendment where we had a certified soil scientist. <laughs> go through his wetland boundaries and that was unanimously approved. And we also submitted a development application that was unanimously approved by the Town of Enfield's Inland Wetland Commission on June 16th of 2020. Uh, so that just gives you kind of a brief idea on the meetings we've attended to date and where we stand. Uh, this is just the All-American Assisted for Living facility that I'll introduce to you guys momentarily. It's just a nice screenshot of what the front entrance will look like, which the architect will be able to speak to a little bit. Uh, next slide here. Basically, this is just an existing conditions plan that we kind of backed out a bit just to give everybody an idea on, on where the site stands. So the site's currently 19.435 acres and it's zoned half BP business professional in the front. And then the back half is zoned R44 for one family residential district to the south. So it's a split zone. And as I get into the development here, just for reference, 
the area to the northeast, north being to the right side of page, is where the, the future development is occurring. So it's basically in this area here, which in historic aerials has been shown to be previously disturbed and it's since been reforested, um, but there is a little bit of a, a mound back here just from a topo standpoint that sits above the wetlands. So ideally, that's the area for development. Uh, vacant wooded area, you can see the vacant wooded area here, and it's divided in half basically. So to the north of the site, or where my cursor is, it's a, a wooded area and a series of wetlands in the middle that take up the majority of the northern portion of the site. And then the southern portion of the site is an agricultural area that's currently farmed um, by an adjacent landowner. So that area basically here in the box, which is about half of our, our site, is currently farmed. And as you'll see in a little bit, I'll get into what we plan on doing with that area. Um, you see here, we're bordered to the north by restaurant and retail. I know Country Diner is right here to the north, and then residences to the south, and then vacant property to the east, and then an agricultural use and a farm to the north. Let's see, as, I, as I discussed, throughout wetlands, there, there's about 2.83 acres of wetlands currently on our site on this northern portion. Let me see. And basically what I pulled up now is, is a colorized version of the site plan that you guys have in your, in your development packets. Uh, we've added the landscaping to this, this plan here just to get, give you guys a sense on, on where everything falls. Um, and before I get into the, the development here, I did want to point out that Kaplan Development has several of these facilities in New England that are currently operating elsewhere in the country. Uh, this will be their first soiree into Connecticut, and they chose the town of Enfield for good reasons. And to touch on that a bit more, I did want to turn it over to Ben Wells of Captain Development to just give you a kind of background on the program and, and kind of why they chose Enfield and what they're all about. Ben, you want to take it over for me? Yep. How, how's everyone in the first soiree into Connecticut, and they chose the town of Enfield for good reasons. And to touch on that a bit more, I did want to turn it over to Ben Wells. Here's some feedback here. Is he got a bad connection or something? Can you guys hear me? I can hear you now. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, uh, my name is Ben Wells with 22, at 22 Andover Road in Old Westbury, New York. Still, everyone hears me, no delay, we're good? Okay, great. Yeah, so you know, I'll let um, Stephen Humphreys from EGA talk more about the architecture. I don't wanna take his thunder so much, but what you have before you is a two-story, slab on grade, 55,000 gross square foot senior housing facility. Um, it is comprised of 45 units of assisted living and 13 units of memory care. So Jeff, if you just go back to the, um, the floor plan for a second. Well, that, that's fine as well, but the floor plan. Um, so on the this is a typical floor plan, but the way it's sited on the uh, site layout, you'll see that the uh, memory care wing is on the south side and um, on the west, on the, um, sorry, on the north side, on the south side it, uh, wing is typical assisted living. So our, our memory care unit is completely locked down. Um, reasons being that we have residents with uh, cognitive issues that you know, we wanna make sure that we, they're secure in a secure environment. They have their own internal courtyard um, in the middle there, and they have pretty much all facilities necessary, activities, dining. Um, they have their own uh, bathroom showers in their units, and then they will be using some of the other building as well, a media room, arts and crafts room, which you can kind of see in that common core uh, with, with guidance and with um, you know, mo monitor, monitors and, and aids. Um, the, the north side of the building, if I'm getting this correct, no, the south side of the building, you want to, Jeff, go back to the, um, it's easier, just go back to the site plan, it's easier, this way. Okay, so there you go. So the south side of the building is traditional assisted living. The whole second floor, which mimics the, um, you know, first floor for the most part, minus the common space, is all residential units, but um, it's all assisted living. And this concept came about in 2009 when we were looking at the state of what was going on in our industry 
And what we noticed was that a lot of people were going after very, very, very high end clientele in higher end demographics. And what we said was there's a real need here for a, a more um, medium income or middle market product that nobody's really addressing. And uh, we had been in the industry, our, our principal, uh, Glenn Kaplan, has been in the industry since 1970s, took a company public in senior housing, and then got back in under Kaplan Development Group in 2001. So, you know, we were, we've been in the industry, we've acquired properties, managed properties, and then we really started ground up development in 2009 after the economic downturn. And um, again, we wanted to build something for the middle market. So that's kind of what we did here. And uh, we started our first one in Massachusetts, in Hanson, Massachusetts, which I would say is a similar demographic to Enfield, Connecticut. Um, we've been very good at targeting secondary markets with this product. And in doing so, we're building, I mean, back in 2009, we were building uh, this facility for you know, $8, 000, $8, sorry, $8 million. Now the costs have gone up significantly, um, but we are seeing costs go down now. But with that said, we were able to pass the savings on to the residents. So, you know, our, our building itself was, was a five-star facility from the looks and feel of it, but we were able to reduce the size of the resident units. We were more focused on the socialization and programming than having grandiose units where, you know, you have somebody that sits inside their unit and they're paying a lot of money for a thousand plus square feet. And, um, you know, we didn't want to do that. We wanted to really focus on the programming. So in doing that, um, we, we built our first community. It filled up in 13 months. Then we built another one in Raynham, Massachusetts, and that filled up in eight months. So we, we realized we were onto something here. And when I say not breaking the bank, a lot of um, facilities in the New England market, in particular Connecticut, they have a la carte services or level of care on top of their base rate. So if somebody moves into a facility, they're going to pay four or $5,000 to get in the door. And then based upon their assessment and the level of care they might need as they age in place, their care level can go up, you know, it could be 2000 plus dollars on top of their base rent. So we're not doing that. What we're doing and what we've been successful in doing with this model. And this is again, the 10th all American assisted living, or sorry, the 11th All-American assisted living that is um, being proposed. The other, the other 10 are, are at stabilization or are very close to stabilization, meaning 93% occupancy. Um, but with that said, um, this facility is going to be around you know, $45 to $4,600, all inclusive of care. So there will not be, there's, there's one level of enhanced care that is for someone that needs an extreme amount, you know, of care when it's pretty much, you know, 24 seven, uh, mobile, you know, trouble with mobilization, trouble with, um, feeding, grooming, you name it. Uh, typically somebody in assisted living community, they're there because they have a, a need it's need driven where they have two or more ADLs, which are activities of daily living that they need help with, whether it's medication management, um, grooming, uh, mobilization, or, you know, something of that nature. So with that said, you know, we, we've done very well with this model because of the market that we've gone after and the fact that people find it attractive. They can stay in a building that doesn't cut corners. It looks like a five-star senior living facility, um, presents itself very well, which uh, Jeff could show you pictures on the bottom of the slide of some of the interior shots. But really that's the, uh, the essence of this. So we have, so we have you know, we operate in in now hopefully Connecticut, New Hampshire, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, um, trying to think, but New York as well with the all American model. So I, I apologize for the long winded uh, just information, but if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask now or later. Yeah, thanks, Ben. I think I could walk you guys through, um, and, and again, I, I appreciate you doing that, just to, so you guys got a sense on what they bring to the table here and what kind of facility they'll be operating once, assuming this gets approved and it goes through permitting here. Um, so as Ben said, it consists of 58 units with a 29,000 square foot footprint. Uh, there's a full access driveway that we're proposing onto Hazard Avenue to the north. Uh, that driveway curb cut and our utility connections will be subject to the um, um, 
There are 69 parking spaces with nine accessible stalls. Uh, the main lot being to the west of the proposed entrance. And then there's an accessory lot to the back or to the rear here on the south side. Uh, there will be one way circulation around the drop off area. And as we get into some of the amenities inside with the architect exterior to the site, there will be a bocce ball court, a putting green, and other site amenities um, for, for residents to utilize. Uh, part of what we had done early on in the process was get the fire marshal involved. And at our, our early application review team meeting, the suggestion was made to us to provide a a driveway or emergency access that would be locked all the time uh, unless unless needed access from the fire department. So there's a gate at the other end of this on Middle Road, as you see at the bottom of the screen here. That is not a public entrance. There will be a gate with a lock similar to what, I think there's a similar condition if you head west um, at the Hartford Hospital entrance where there's a, a Knox box, a gate, and a chain that goes across it that the fire department would have a, a key to. So that's the reason why we had provided this emergency access drive. It is a little over a thousand feet to get to this part of the site. So that goes to show you how, how large the site actually is. Um, see, the other thing worth noting, I know it's come up and there's been, we'll get into it a bit in a little, a little while with uh, an adjacent uh, landowner here. We wanted to point out um, the proximity of our, our development, if I go back here. Being as our site is sitting in this Northeast corner, the mature forest that's there today, basically all the way up to the edge of this wetland line and then north to Hazard Ave will remain in place. And the distance from the edge of our limited disturbance in this location to the, to the west here is about 350 feet. And then the back portion of our parking lot to the rear is about 480 feet uh, just to get over to the property line. So it, it is a good distance away and the site kind of it kind of sets itself up for where you can develop just based on the location of wetlands here. Um, it's also worth noting while I'm on this screen, that given the site is, um, let's see, uh, 8.91 acres, or actually, let me see here. Give me one second. It's a little, it's 19 acres and change and only a portion of it, it's three and a half acres or 19% of our development is in this area. So we're only developing 19% of a much larger area and also, part of the wetland process. And I know it was important to the client to work with an adjacent landowner here. And it was brought to our attention at one of the wetlands meetings we attended that given this was an agricultural use on the south here, um, that there was the desire to, to have that remain as such. And the applicant agreed, and it's part of the conditions of approval for wetlands, that the, um, they were gonna provide an agricultural easement to the town of Enfield totaling 8.91 acres, allowing it to remain as farmland in perpetuity. So basically that is a line from the edge of woods from east to west that goes all the way out to Middle Road and the applicant does not plan on doing, any plan on doing anything in this area here. So that was something that was conditioned as part of the wetland approval. Uh, we are not seeking any development is consistent with the planning and zoning regulation. And then from, uh, I'll jump back. The, uh, just as far as landscaping goes, we are providing shade trees along the, the western edge of the property, along the frontage along Hazard Avenue, and then a handful of trees within the parking area to the rear. Um, during some of the comments, we did receive some uh, requests for additional screening uh, with, with maybe some evergreens to, to help screen that property to the west uh, that I mentioned to you guys earlier, that's about three. I don't think the applicant would have any issues if there was a certain place over in this region that we could supplement with some evergreen trees. Part of our wetland approval, which we will be going we come back for building permits, and this gets circulated to all the department heads, part of the approval will be to provide a mitigation plan that basically takes some of the areas of wetlands we were disturbing and we're giving back or creating wetlands at a two to one ratio. Um, so that area is going to be back here. And at the same time we do that planting plan, um, we'll be able to incorporate some of those comments we received for just a couple of additional plants from, and evergreens in this vicinity. Um, let me see here. I'm going to move on to our next slide. There's been a lot of talk with our drainage plan. Um, I hope the sheet doesn't overwhelm you. There's a lot going on here, which I'll try to talk through with you guys. Um, our stormwater design is in accordance with the 2004 Connecticut Stormwater Quality Manual and local stormwater regulations. 
what we try and do in a situation like this, especially when there's wetlands and, and the sensitivity given the area, we look to mimic drainage patterns. So that's exactly what we've done here. The goal being that we don't want to take water that's going one way and divert it another way in the sense that you can probably dry up or affect the, the wetlands in a negative way. Um, so what we have designed here is something that takes the three existing drainage patterns that are on site, one of them which heads to the west and into the existing wetland body that's here today. One of it heads to, one of the areas heads to the east and there's a wetland body on the eastern property and then part of it heads out to the north onto Hazard Avenue. So what you'll find in our drainage design is that we've, we've met slightly reduced uh, peak flow rates for the 210, 25, and 100 year storm events, all while providing quality measures through a series of best management practices uh, via, there's basically four underground infiltration basins, and there's three or four above ground uh, infiltration basins. And to come up with those numbers, I know there was some uh, discussion and some comments we received that there was no geotechnical report or that we, we hadn't had water, data, water information uh, as we did our design here. I can assure you we, we do have a geotechnical report. We used it as the basis of our design and all of our infiltration basins have at least the minimum two feet of separation to get water. Uh, and there was, there was also talk about there being shale um, deposits within our building footprint. And we can assure there's not. It was, there was eight borings done uh, within the vicinity of our building footprint and there were no issues whatsoever. Um, and it's a, sh a regular shallow uh, footing system here. So we were able to provide quality through these underground Coltec rechargers. There's basically an isolator row in each one of the underground chambers that will handle the TSS removal as part of that. And then most of them, including on the north side, go into an additional measure of an infiltration basin prior to exiting into the wetland. So we are maintaining the drainage patterns best we can and, and it matches what's there. And we're confident going through wetlands that the water that's getting to the wetlands today is the water that's going to be getting to the wetlands in post-construction conditions. With regards to utility, so on this plan, um, you have electric in red, water in blue, sanitary in brown, and then the stormwater conveyance system itself is in green. Uh, the utility corridor in the architect drawings is in this northeast corner of the building, which is also where we have a backup generator, a transformer, and then the dumpster location. Um, and all of that ties out to Hazard Avenue, so utilities are readily available just given it's a heavily traveled corridor, commercialized corridor. Um, one of the concerns which will come up during building permit review is with the water pressures. Um, basically what you see in blue here is an existing water line that the water company dead-ended right at this location. So we're looking at doing a hydraulic analysis, which we're currently coordinating with the local water provider. Um, and at which time, once we have that data, we will determine with the fire marshals uh, review where the best place to uh, place a fire hydrant on site, similar to the previous application, uh, the, the ideal location for the fire lanes will be as we submit for building permit and they get a second review of the drawings here. Um, so that's basically, there's a 2000 gallon grease interceptor to handle uh, the restaurant component. It's a restaurant that's just for residents only. I know the architect can probably speak to what, what that is, but the 2000 gallon grease interceptor that will tie in out here, we will have to go for the appropriate uh, application. Submit for the appropriate applications with the Board of Health once we get to that point from a building permit standpoint. Uh, let me see here. And then from an erosion control standpoint, we're looking at the, we're in accordance with the 2002 Connecticut guidelines for erosion and sediment control. We will have a temporary construction entrance off Hazard Avenue. There'll be silt fencing along the perimeter. We have implemented temporary sediment traps, which were reviewed at the Inland Wetlands meeting. Um, and provided inlet filters on all catch basins within the city of development. And all of those measures I just mentioned are going to remain in place through the duration of construction. And just moving on from here. Uh, just to touch briefly on lighting, uh, they are, what we are proposing is a, a slim Garco ECF's LED light. LED light. Uh, compliant fixtures, they have a max height of 14 feet. Uh, I believe we have 12 single poles, uh, one double pole, and I want to say four triple poles. And in the back area here, circled in red, we have these Lumiere bollard lights along the pedestrian walkway to the rear here that opens up to a patio for residents. 
Uh, with that, I know there was a lot of information there. And once Stephen goes through his, his architecture here, we'll be happy to open it up for questions. And Stephen, come for you. Come to Architects. Are you, are you on? I am. I'm here. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Yep. Great. Uh, my name is Stephen Humphreys. I'm from EJ Architects. We're out of Newburyport, Massachusetts. We've been working with Kaplan Development on these projects for probably the last 10 years. Um, since Jeff and Ben hit most of the, the numbers on the building as far as the number of units, 58 units and square footage, I'm going to just jump to the floor plan and give you kind of a walkthrough of what we have and some of the design ideas. Um, the plan, as you know, is, is upside down to the site plan. Uh, so north is to the left and south is to the right. Um, you enter the building from the bottom of the page where it says main entry drive. As you come in, uh, you come into a lobby. Um, the areas that are in green are generally what's called in the common areas. So there's a main dining room at the back. There's a bistro, a media room, and a parlor and a library. Uh, the area that's in gray to the left of the dining is the main commercial kitchen which feeds the entire facility. Um, although the apartments have little kitchenettes in them, uh, generally they don't get used other than maybe for ice cream and all the meals are served from that kitchen. Um, there's administration area that's in the center of the building, which is like an orangey color. And just to the left of that is a wellness center. On the right side of the building is traditional assisted living, which is the pink. Those are a two bedroom apartments. Um, which either can be shared by, sorry, there's an echo, shared by non-related residents or one person can buy the whole apartment if they want, it's up to them. The left side of the plan is the memory care wing, which is in the purple, and that has its own dining area, living area. It has a secure courtyard in the center of the building. Um, there's one elevator in the building, it's in the middle in red. And then we have four egress stairs as needed for a code. Um, we do have a lot of outdoor spaces on the building. It's important for the residents to get out and it's a connection to the outside, but there's a, a main patio off the back of the building or the east, which is for the dining. There's another one to the right of that in the plan off the arts and crafts and media room. And then along the front of the building, there's a covered porch. Uh, I think that hits kind of the highlights of the first floor. Um, we provided elevations of all sides of the building. Um, then what we're trying to get with the exterior is uh, this is a home. So we want to have the building look residential, um, even though it is an institutional use. Um, so we're going with really traditional building forms, um, you know, gable and hip roofs, um, traditional materials as far as lap siding and shingle siding. Uh, you know, traditional window patterns. Um, Jeff, can you go to the, uh, the very first picture of the building? There we go. That's probably a better representation. This is the building in Hanson. This is generally exactly what we're building to as far as colors. Um, so it's, it's light tans on the lower level, um, a lighter tan on the second level. Um, very, very simple forms, but we try to keep the scale of the building um, down and the lengths of the building not too long, you know, so you don't have long corridors and shorter travel distance for the residents. Um, I think that's it. I think if there's any questions you have about the building, I'd be happy to answer. Commissioners, anybody? You, you know, I have one quick question. In terms of on your plans, you show a dog run. What the heck is that for? That is a fenced in area for residents that have dogs and they want to get them out there and, and stretch their legs. Because I know that you also have an infiltration basin somewhere in that vicinity. Is, is that kind of just conducive to being in the same position? <laughs> Jeff, can yeah. you go to the, the site plan? Yep. Yeah, because because yeah, in that corner, in the, it's actually yeah. right right opposite the patio, so it's it's actually a little further over. Yeah, so it's in between. Let's the fire access lane and kind of a walkway off the patio. 
Yeah, and, and those infiltration basins, the larger of the infiltration basins are the ones that are underground where we're getting our water quality volumes from. Those were just to help reduce the flows leaving the site over here. So we're actually getting our numbers from this front infiltration basin and under here as well. So I would say that the amount of usage that we'll get and the separation that currently is there that any result would be negligible. Great. You're good, Rich? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, as long as, you know, everybody's looked at it, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I know that they have some, you know, above ground infiltration basins, not necessarily the below ground infiltration system. So, and, mm -hmm. and that's really the what, what I was looking at is the above ground infiltration systems, not the below ground infiltration. Yeah, and, and if there were, I mean, if there were some concerns, I don't know that there'd be any objection from the applicant to shift this around and then just provide a larger storage area to provide a, a separation distance that you guys feel comfortable with. But as, as the engineer of record, I, I would be comfortable with the size that this is relative to its location to the three um, water quality structures that we have here. All right. Yeah, as long as it's that white spot that's kind of in the middle in between everything. Correct. All right, thank you. Any Mr. other commissioners? Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Commissioner Alimo. Yeah, uh, in the same area, uh, looking at that east uh, property line that, that's, that is there, um, are you proposing any kind of security or barrier or some type of protection for the residents as they gather out here in, their, in the main patio uh, area out there um, for their safety? Are people just gonna be able to walk up from that area? right where you're in that whole area there. Yep, yeah, Ben, I don't know if you guys typically put, put up any barriers for residents. What we did from a design standpoint in which why these don't infiltrate all that much water is that they're really shallow. Um, so there's not, a, there's not a big drop off coming out of here. I don't know um, other facilities, Ben, if that's something that you'd, you'd wanna entertain but from an engineering standpoint. Yeah. I was looking at um, from the perspective of the residents having protection from anybody from the outside maybe i wasn't clear um oh oh oh, oh. I, yeah i got you fencing, yeah, um, perimeter fencing perimeter fencing yeah because that's what looks like they're going to be that's their main gathering area um recreations out there looks like as well just, yeah, ben, if for, for, their, for, their, for their safety i was just wondering if you had anything in no, mind it's a, good, or, it's a good question yeah, historically we don't have an issue i mean this is you know not the first building that we build of this type or other types and typically we don't have fencing around the entire site we just have temporary fencing during construction um, obviously if there's life safety or if there's any drop-offs and grading of course we would address that and um, we, would, we would have that there um, as far as you know 24 hour surveillance safety you know with cameras around the building we have somebody at the front desk 24/7 um, um, we have people in the building 24/7. We have a uh, you know pendant uh, pull cord um, system for residents. Uh, you know we, we we monitor. You know we deal with the Department of Health, so we'll do everything we have to uh, to meet the requirements of the state. And uh, you know the last thing we want from an operator is any development issues. So if it was mm -hmm. something that we were concerned about, you know that would definitely be something we would have uh, we would have addressed already. But we frequently don't have issues where we need you know fencing around the perimeter of the building. Understood, understood. Um, you have uh, systems in place that uh, obviously you have to uh, watch out for your residents and tenants. Right. Um, and I know we haven't gotten to, uh, I have some questions about the roadway, but that piece of it's coming up or are we ready to discuss right. the Hazard Avenue? You can ask away, I'll, I'll try to answer best I, I can. Did, I did see the, uh, the police department's notes and that was one of my big concerns. You know, I'm really happy mm -hmm. to see something getting developed on this land. Yep. You know, a lot of things, a lot of things have been uh, pr proposed, not proposed, but looked at for there. So yep. uh, that's a good thing for the community. It looks like it's a nice place, but it's very dangerous um, out there. Uh, you know, along the country diner, I believe the officer even mentions that um, 111 Hazard Avenue uh, resident uh, uh, area. Uh, yep. Yeah, so just up here. Do you have a, do you have a, a can you tell us what you're going to be doing there and the length of whatever you're doing? Because it is yep. definitely an issue. Yeah, so so basically the, the one real benefit 
especially to develop a piece of land like this, given, given those concerns, is that the assisted living facility, just in, by the nature of its use, is an incredibly low traffic generator. Um, I think, and, and Ben can correct me if I'm wrong, out of the 24 memory care patients, no one, not one of them has a vehicle on site. Um, and then out of the remaining units that are there, uh, they've done studies at their 10 other facilities and less than 5% of residents even have a vehicle, um, which, which really does look to limit the trips coming in and out of this site. And part of what we will do is we have those studies that we will be submitting as part of DOT because that driveway access is subject to DOT approval. And we will be submitting some of the historic data that we have. Um, and as an engineer, we wouldn't want an unsafe condition either. Um, but this is, is probably one of the, the uses that the traffic is so low that's being generated from something like this um, that we don't have that same concern um, as he had mentioned, just given the, the width of the roadway. Um, it's just, you know, it's just, a, it's just the traffic, you know, there without this building coming in. And Correct. what I see, you know, my observation, people trying to turn, you know, into 111 Hazard Avenue or even going south, um, there's us, they did uh, a configuration in front of the uh, Hartford Hospital building there that uh, helped them. There's a type yep. of widening system they did there. I'm just thinking about, you know, um, how it's going to be there. It's really tight. and. Yep, and it's a valid concern, and ultimately, at the end of the day, when we submit this to the DOT, they're going to take their time to review it. And they're, you know, in the past, we've had gotten comments from there where we had to widen the road three or four feet to make that exact situation happen. Um, it's usually based on what the the development is that's coming in and what the projected volumes would be. Um, but we will have that data for them that will have to get approved by the DOT prior to us even going to construction um, and submitting for building permits. So. Um, that is something that we are taking seriously and we will be going through the proper channels to get that approved. Now, that's going to be the entrance um, should, uh, unfortunately, somebody need some medical attention or EMS service um, to the facility. That would be uh, the entrance, correct? Uh, for correct. And, uh, and unless from a fire standpoint, if that EMS would also qualify and they would have a, a lock to the, the box back here, it's probably just as quick if they're going to get to the intersection at the corner and make the right-hand turn to get in. But I guess at the end of the day, um, EMTs and fire could have access to the back driveway as well. I think I think of an am, I think an ambulance probably is going to come in off of 190. I would I would 100% agree. Yeah, so I just want to put that out there so it's part of the discussion. Again, I'm not trying to push anything onto the to the property owner or the developers here unnecessarily, yep. but I think you know you really have to look at that um, and for the safety of the community too. You know, our community people drive up and down that street all the time. Um, and, you know, we don't want anybody, uh, you know, getting hurt out there, any, any accidents. So, um, thank you. Uh, Understood. Your, I, I appreciate it. Thank you, Frank. You're welcome. Commissioner Suzak. Because, you know, I, I, along those lines, in terms of your, your parking, because I've, I've, I've gone to quite a few of these facilities, and I've noticed that sometimes, you know, because of the fact that the residents always have visitors or there's, you know, you know, people are associated with, the, you know, the residents that stay at your facilities, that you know just to get a parking spot sometimes you know when when i go to some of these facilities it's very difficult because of the fact that you know there's there's always you know somebody visiting somebody and there's quite a few residents that you do have there and that you know is there any way that you're going to handle that excess you know parking requirement when you have a, a surge of you know people who are trying to visit somebody well to answer that question i mean we Again, we historically, you know, we have the data and we can look at the analysis. And of course, if we needed more parking, we would have proposed it. But based upon the same building with the 58 units, 112 beds, you know, we, we had no issue. Some of our buildings have had less parking. This actually has proposed more parking than some of the others where we have 50, as little as 57 parking spaces in um, one of our facilities in Massachusetts. And, you know, again, we're talking about, you know, staff, so we generate 50 to 70 paychecks. That's full-time and part-time people where, when we're stabilized at 93% occupancy. It's gonna take us some time to get there. But when we do get there, you're talking about three different shifts and max shift, you're gonna have 25 to 30 um, staff members. 
again, as Jeff said, less than 5%, I wouldn't even say 5% of our residents park a vehicle on site. And I will tell you that they sit there and they do not get used. If anything, they get rust, they rust away. And, um, you know, they might come into the building, a resident, and they want to have a car with them, or it's a, you know, it's a, talk, it's a point for their, for their family members that are moving them in. Say, you know, you have a car, we have transportation available. We have a 15 passenger bus that, you know, on, on normal times when we're not dealing with COVID, we would take residents to, you know, to the casinos or shows, uh, grocery shopping, uh, doctor's visits. We also have a secondary vehicle, an eight passenger van. So as far as making it convenient, we don't want our residents to drive. I mean, most of them probably shouldn't be driving um, if they do have a car and for their own safety. And um, so the parking lot, my point is, is the parking lot remains quite empty during peak hours, peak staffing hours, you're going to see there's going to be you know, half the lot empty. So if we had an issue, except for two days out of the year, uh, Mother's Day, Christmas Day, where you have visitors, and we will speak with neighbor, I mean, maybe a neighbor, um, a neighbor, whether it's the Hartford Hospital or something of that nature, and we've done this in other in other uh, sites as well, where we'll work out something where we can have all-site parking for those two days, which are obviously extremely uh, seldom, and we will transport people back and forth with a bus. Outside of that, I'm going to tell you that this parking is more than ample for a community this size. Again, you know, and I'm not really t talking about the residents themselves having cars. I'm, I'm saying that, you know, m m my mother was in, in, a, in a home, and, and every time I went to see her, it was tough to get a parking spot, believe me. It, it's, you know, if, if anybody has any family in the, in the area, you know, they're, their family is going to visit. And if, if you have 112 residents there and 25 employees and there's a shift change, so all of a sudden you have, you know, 50 employees that are trying to, you know, shuffle past, past each other and you have visitors trying to visit, it becomes very difficult to provide parking. And, and I'm talking from experience. I've seen it a hundred times. And, and, you know, and that's what I'm saying. I'm not really saying that your residents are, have the parking. It's all the visitors that visit your residents right. that, that have the difficulty of, of finding a parking. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm not sure where they're going to go. But anyways, but that's just a concern I have. Understood. Thank you. Any other commissioners? I have a few questions myself. Um, you stated there's no waivers for this application? Uh, no, no variances for the application. Okay, where are the sidewalks on the front on Hazard Avenue? Uh, basically, there are no sidewalks that exist along Hazard Ave, east or west, um, on our side or the north side of the property. Um, and, and we wouldn't feel that it'd be a safe condition to introduce a sidewalk up there that would go to, to nowhere. Um, especially given the constraints that we're up against with the wetlands and the DOT right of way um, it would be quite challenging. You'd end up having to, you know, go for an additional permit to fill wetlands within a DOT right of way, which would just open up a, a can of worms here. Um, and again, there are no sidewalks uh, all the way down, I believe, to the, you get to the grocery store corner. Um, and then as far down, I think when you go back towards um, the plaza that has Planet Fitness down to the, the east there, um, but adjacent parcels, none of which have sidewalks. Now, I know farther down, they required a gentleman to put sidewalks in, and it looks a little strange because the sidewalks start nowhere and go nowhere, but the goal is to piece them all in. And our regulation is pretty clear that all, all new construction is to have sidewalks along the roadway. So to not uh, apply for a waiver of sidewalks, you can't just throw the sidewalk regulation away and not address it because you feel that it's going to be too extensive to put them in the project. I, I just, I think it becomes a public safety issue myself. I don't think that it would be from, from a design and cost standpoint, that's not the issue. It would be having sidewalks that really go nowhere on either side. Um, and there certainly would be design challenges that came along with it, but um, right, that, but then you would then you would request a waiver. Correct. Which you haven't. We have not formally requested a waiver, nor did it come up during any of our meetings to date. Um, 
So, okay, that's my first concern. Uh, second concern is along with Commissioner Suzak on the staff parking. Uh, I did a quick count and 25 staff members at a shift change, that's 50 staff members. That leaves you approximately six to seven extra spaces during a shift change for the entire parcel. So if you have more than six residents that own vehicles, you're already short parking. I mean, I think for, from our standpoint, we do have 10 of these facilities and I know that that case has never happened at any of their facilities. And I understand it's a concern of the commission, um, but I think that the data kind of speaks for itself just with regards to their existing facilities. Um, and I know later on in this application, there's a something that's coming up where they're asking us to reduce the amount of parking um, on site here. And again, the, they've gone as low as 57 spaces and, and 69 spaces for out of the 10 of their developments is probably on the high side from what they're used to. And they, they never have issues with, with parking or anybody being able to find it other than <laughs> mentioned by Ben. And how many actual spaces are on this site? 69 spaces, including nine handicaps though. Including nine, so 60 spaces. So going off of the numbers you just gave us mm -hmm. at a 25 head staff count during shift change, that's 50 spaces right there. And that leaves you 10 empty spaces with no residents having cars. I, I just- yeah, I would say black and white is just having 30 What's people that? coming at the same time where they were parked there for a significant amount of time. They would be staggered, I'm assuming by 10 to 15 minute intervals where there would be adequate parking. But Ben, correct me if I'm wrong, that, that hasn't been an issue on any of the 10 facilities you guys have that are of similar size, correct? Correct. And we also, you know, that's also saying, I mean, I, mean, I understand you have to account for the fact that it could be possible, but yeah. it's not every staff member is coming with a vehicle as well. They, I mean, I know it's, again, different times, but some are using public transportation. You sometimes have husband and wife that work in the building. Um, you know, so it's, we've never had an issue with parking. That's, I mean, I, I don't know how I can get you more comfortable except for telling you um, we could, you know, have somebody or somebody from the board can go out to our facilities and go during peak hours and take a look at the parking lots. And you'll, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. You'll see a half empty a lot during peak hours. Yeah, and to put that in perspective, I know one of the con. Oh, he froze up. Jeff? Inadequate. No, and go ahead. Say that again, please, Jeff, because you froze oh. up for a while. Sorry. So basically, we received a comment from the adjacent landowner uh, that requested we reduce the amount of spaces uh, to help reduce impervious on that southern side of the site near the wetlands there and on the side of the agricultural field in this location. Um, in doing so, I reached out to Ben and asked if there was, you know, what, what do they normally come in with from parking standpoint? And 60 spaces was a comfortable number that as the, the developer and who would be running the facility, they were comfortable dropping this to the 60 prior to this meeting. Now having hear, heard your side of and, and your concerns, um, you know, we'll probably look to keep as many on here as we can, um, but they as an operator were comfortable going down to 60 or even 58 if need be. Um, and basically the regulation as it reads, I believe it's one space per two dwelling units, which puts it at, I believe 29 spaces plus one per employee on a shift, which would be 30. So the, the technical requirement for an assisted living facility of this nature per town regulations is 59 spaces. So we're 10 spaces in excess of what the town requires as far as parking demand goes, if that helps to, to kind of define. Yeah, how many spaces in excess? It's one per two units. We have 58 units, so it's 29 spaces and then one yep. per employee and there's 30 employees. So 59 required and we have 69 total. I thought you said you had 60. No, we uh, have minor nine, handicaps. 60 minus the nine handicaps. Though. Oh, right. Counting the handicap, you have 69. Correct. Okay. Um, and then there's a lot of um, concerns about this particular piece of land, the environmentals. Has the phase one and phase two been completed? 
Uh, yeah, we, we have a phase one that was done with no hotspots. There was something pointed out to us by the adjacent landowner, which came up in our phase one, that there was a potential spill on the property, I believe, to the east, um, that they had just mentioned that, you know, if this moves forward and we're going to construction, that we would look into that, um, you know, that cleanup that took place in the 90s just to ensure that there are no issues with our site. And that's something that we would end up having to do anyways, just from a development standpoint, as we move forward through building permits. So phase one was completed, nothing on site. Uh, the geotech was completed again, and everything came back really good from a geotechnical standpoint as well, so. Okay, the, the property to the east that you're referring to, um, that's the Alimo parcel? Correct. Okay, um, and you said that was cleaned up in the 90s? I wanted, I, I got that information today. I briefly looked through, I think there were eight years or so, there was material that came through that mentioned something about that cleanup. Um, I may be mistaken on the year, but the letter was from 2006, I believe, or 2001, but it talked to previous efforts to clean up that site. So there may be right. more than that. I just haven't worked my way through every single document. Here. Well, efforts are one thing, but actually cleaning it up is another because I am exactly. very aware that the owner of that parcel approached the town after 2005 for a huge tax abatement because of the contaminated land and it not being worth any money. So okay. um, we're kind of getting contradicting stories that if the land was cleaned up in the 90s, then maybe some fraud was committed. And if it hasn't been cleaned up, then maybe you guys might want to do a little due diligence, some core testing in that corner to see what you're getting into. Um, we, have, we, we have done that. Just, just to back up a second, we did do yeah. uh, the core samples in the phase one along, you know, throughout the property. What we didn't do was go off site at all right. um, to the adjacent parcel, which is what that document refers to. So as right. we development here um you know having a phase two done on our site would just help to one cover the developer you know from anything that's coming off of this site so that they can go after the right people for cleanup yeah. if we encountered anything on our site throughout development and we touched that soil then you know we would own it if we hadn't determined that so that will be a step based on that letter we received um that we would perform the phase two just to ensure nothing's going on prior to construction well, you've already done test pits, correct? On our site, and nothing right. came back. Right. Nothing came back. So whether or not anything off-site was there, um, that's what the phase two would help to determine where you dive into those documents a bit more. And some of that detailed due diligence you're referring to um, would get turned out during the phase two process. Right. Now, isn't a phase two test pits, which you've already done? We've done test pits from phase a- Phase one is basically documents. Phase one's documents, the test pits I was referring to were the geotechnical test pits. The phase one historical data that we have, we had not performed a phase two yet based on what we found during the phase two. He froze up again. Two prior to going to construction, just to ensure that nothing comes up on that corner. Okay, so you didn't do a phase two for the environmentals, you did it for the geotechnical. Correct. We had the board done in the building, so I misspoke on that. Okay. All right. Um, and then yeah, there so was other there were other environmental concerns I know from the adjacent landowner with regards to stormwater, which I know we we touched on at wetlands. Uh, that process wasn't a public hearing, which is why I think a lot of their comments um, are coming up now after the fact and during the planning and zoning process. Um, hopefully, our testimony tonight helped to. Um, alleviate some of those concerns. We do appreciate the concerns, um, and I know we'll hear from them in a bit, um, but, but happy to answer any more questions um, regarding stormwater as well. Well, we will address the stormwater issues, but anything related to wetlands uh, has nothing to do with this board. Therefore, right. we really can't even take any testimony for it. It should have been done at the wetlands meeting. Uh, so I guess you've answered all my questions. I agree with Commissioner Alimo. It is a beautiful building. Um, I do think that something needs to be addressed with the sidewalks um, because I'm not just for, okay, so don't fit the nature. We don't push the regulations. We've got to follow the regulations that are in place. So either you apply for a waiver at a later date and the sidewalks are a condition of approval until you request a waiver if it passes. 
Um, but everything else, I think you've answered for me pretty well. Oh, one last thing. The, you're saying the fire department's requesting that thousand foot roadway out to Middle Road? It was requested by town staff. I, I, must, I think it was the fire chief at the time. It was about a year ago now from the ART process that somebody brought that up. We did not, want it. We did not propose that on the initial plans that had gone in. Um, and it was requested of us through those town meetings that we provide an emergency access out to middle. I, I mean, that's just, you're cutting that beautiful piece of land right in half back there with that roadway. And um, I, I would definitely ask that we look into that also, uh, because if it's not a regulation or required, I, I would assume not having it. I could see the one for Harford Hospital because it's short, it's right off the lot and it's at the corner. But I mean, we're supposed to be maintaining that rear property as agricultural land. And now you're yep. gonna have snow plows running down there, plowing that, putting salt down, going into the fields and stuff like that. So yeah, basically the, the way we did it, it was compacted gravel. So it's not actually, it's H20 loaded for their fire trucks apparatus, but it's not gonna be paved so that wouldn't be an issue but at the same time to your point we would have no issue at all um assuming the fire chief's okay with it to remove it from the plans and or try to position it there. we were respecting the landscape buffer along this property line here um if there was a way and we talked about this during the wetlands meeting that this could shift closer to the property line we would have no issues with that either and then that would take this agricultural easement that right now we were proposing to go up to the edge of the gravel drive on the west side and then up to that tree line, that would just make that area of 8.9 acres a bit larger um, if we got rid of this, because I don't think the developer would have any issues just you know, deeding this whole thing or giving an easement, an agricultural easement of this whole piece back here, which is a lot cleaner. Yeah, no, no issues from the applicant here. Exactly right. And, and when we coordinate the hydrant locations in the fire lane, if we find out that they're you know, okay with us getting rid of that, again, we would have no issues removing that from the plan. Right. Okay. Is is uh, Scott Ellis on? Did Scott come on? I don't think that's his area. I I would really I would like an explanation from the fire chiefs of how they feel a thousand foot driveway to an adjacent road is a requirement for this development. So I, I would definitely want information on that because nothing is addressed to that as far as the fire uh, chief's comments or the fire marshal's comments. So um, I think it's an eye store. And if you look at the one over on Weymouth Road for Pheasant Hill, it's all overgrown, it's ugly. The road has got weeds coming up through it. It's got a rusty chain hanging across it and there's no appeal at all. And if we're trying to maintain some sort of an agricultural look over there, having this road that's gonna get overgrown, especially if it's not paved, it is just, I don't see any logic to it whatsoever unless the fire marshal uh, would like to educate me on why he feel it's necessary. Yeah, and so, to, to his credit, going back through the, you know, a year ago, I don't recall them saying it was a requirement more than it was just a recommendation to us as the applicant, which is why we went ahead and showed it. Um, I could certainly, as we're coordinating here and we have that hydraulic analysis done for the water, we're gonna have to have him review the hydrant location as well. Um, if, if a hydrant is necessary um, within close proximity to the building here, which I'm assuming it will be, uh, but we could certainly look to get that information from you, but again, we have it designed where we could put it in if we needed to. If we can take this out as we go forward with our building permit set, which would also get reviewed by the fire department. Yeah. Um, be more than happy to do that. Right. Um, I, I would, and I don't know how the commissioners feel, but I would be okay that if the fire marshal will approve this without that being required, that we don't make it a condition of approval, they can take this off the plan but the sidewalks, absolutely not. That would have to be on the plans. Um, there is no waiver or anything, so it should be there until they were to address it at a later date and ask the commission to remove them. Other than those two, um, I'm pretty good with it. You've answered everything. Um, you've put a lot of questions to rest. Like I said, I know a lot of issues with wetlands have been being thrown back and forth, but we are not the Wetlands Commission at this time. And therefore, um, 
any discussion regarding the wetlands will get shut down. It should have been addressed, addressed at that time. Uh, any other commissioners' comments before I open it? To I have a follow up. Suzak. Hold on, Commissioner Suzak. Yeah, because right. I have just a couple comments in terms of I'm pretty sure that the reason the fire marshal had that extra access point was that if there was ever um, a, a problem getting into the site at that front one drive area, that they would not be able to get a fire truck into the site at all. In terms of, you know, if the fire was, you know, possibly along that northern wing and you know there was a problem getting you know to it then you know they, they could never get to, to that that building with any of his fire apparatus but i also looked at the plans and i didn't see you know anywhere where there's any like snow um storage areas for the winter time in terms of you know it seems like you know you have a parking lot and some drives but you know, do you have some allocated, you know, snow storage areas that you're going to have so that you can remove snow and put it somewhere? That yeah, uh, during normal snow events, we, we talked about this during wetlands because they brought that up as well. And that was one of their hot button issues. And basically, we had agreed to truck everything from this front lot to the back here along, along the area right in here. Um, and then on the side over here, if, in fact, the storm event was large enough where it couldn't be contained in these areas, um, it would be trucked off site to a different facility. Um, a lot of times with the larger events, like a foot or two, um, it's, it's more difficult to store. The other option, which we do on a lot of projects, and in this one, until I heard the concerns from the commission, um, they will pile it up in the spaces that are furthest from the main entrance. And in our case, if we did that, it would basically close up these those last 10 spaces that would get us down closer to the town regulation, with the premise being that you have your, your snow melt we then have the ability to get into the system, into the water quality system. Um, but that's that's typical in, in most developments here. Because I have one, one more question about the parking. In terms of you mentioned the fact that you know you required one space for every two units of um, residential use, but but those two units have four beds. So is it you know based upon the fact that you know there's four beds associated with one parking spot, or is it? you know, two beds associated with one parking spot. In terms of normally a unit is one bed, but you have two, two beds per unit. So that, you know, are we really looking at half the number of spaces? And, 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 and I haven't had the chance to, to research that, but yeah. you know, I, and I, that, and that is the question in terms of, you know, all of a sudden you could have six beds in a unit and then, then you can say, well, all I need are, you know, one parking spot for you know, two units, and, but you have 12 beds. That doesn't make any sense. I think it has to, something to do with beds, not units. So I think that we what we could do is get a clarification on that. Yeah, we certainly could clarify it again. It wasn't really an issue from a development standpoint because we had in excess of what any of their existing historic facilities have in place and it was more than adequate. It wasn't until we saw a um, letter from an adjacent landowner that, that kind of questioned that, that mentioned the one space per two units. Um, so we haven't looked into that detail. But again, we're comfortable with the 69 spaces proposed. Mr. Chair, I have uh, hold on, Commissioner Alimo. Commissioner Suzak, I agree with what you're saying, but all of the health facilities on that road and all of the plazas on the other side of the road do not have rear exits and have 500 times the volume that this project does. So that's what I'm trying to establish is how are you requiring this particular plaza or this particular location to have it when we just approved the medical center right down the road that doesn't have it you've got all the shopping um the Laterno plazas and stuff over there they don't have rear exits so it's kind of you set a precedence and they're kind of going against the president we have precedence we all would like things you know to be perfect but if it's not required how do you you know, make a recommendation to put a thousand foot driveway in. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm not trying to defend him, fire marshal. I'm just trying to look at for a reason why in terms of, you know, I think right. that we, we need to investigate it. And if, if, it wasn't, if it's not totally required, you know, it, it shouldn't totally be required. But right. And that's all I'm asking is that maybe we get the fire marshal here who made that recommendation and look for a little explanation on how one plaza right down the road just got approved without it and this one is being recommended for one 
that's all I'm saying. I'm trying to be fair to all the applicants and, you know, we set a precedence, let's follow it. That's, that's yep. it. Yeah. Um, so other than the sidewalks, I think you've answered everything and I would definitely like to hear from the fire marshal. So thank you. Uh, Commissioner. Thank you, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a clarification and uh, a follow-up. Uh, the land to the east is not this alignment land for the record. <laughs> No, that's not me. No, <laughs> for the record. Good. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's the clarification. Uh, just to follow up on uh, uh, logistics, the operational piece we were talking about, the employees. Do they work a typical uh, medical industry, uh, twelve-hour on, twelve-hour off shift? Are they staggered shifts, or is it everybody coming and going? You know, just to get back to that parking uh, piece a little mm -hmm. bit. How does that work on an operational point? If you can answer that, I'm not sure if um, that's something you can answer. Yeah, they're uh, three eight-hour shifts. Eight so they hours. are the typical three eight-hour shifts. Okay. Right. All right. And the other thing, uh, uh, you know, on the lines of uh, the egress from the back, I was just wondering, during the communications with the fire department, was there some issue about egress? through the main entrance off of Route 190? Um, was there a width, uh, a turn radius issue? Uh, any of those type of things that would uh, have it make it difficult for them to enter? No, not that I recall. I know we had provided as well, um, this uh, pavers in the back here that would allow them to pull in and then back out and then out this way. So I believe they were fine, but that, that again is something that we should have clarified and, and we have no problem removing that should that not be an issue and if they're so, not going to to design that, we would rather not connect anything out to Middle Road. But back to the main entrance, did you go through the process with turning radius templates yes. uh, with length? So it wasn't something there that keyed them to ask for the other access point, or egress point? I don't, I don't believe so. We did circulate okay. vehicular templates through the site, um, but we'll verify that with those. With so, your main, so your main entrance is, is fine? Correct. All the requirements. Okay. Enough, it's two-way. It's, it's yeah. Okay. That's one, one of the questions I had. Thank you. I'm good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No problem. Just one more thing that came up. Are you going to be petitioning the DOT for a light at the main entrance? Uh, no, not not given the, the low traffic generating use that we're proposing. Um, okay. They would force that on us. Uh, okay. But for an encroachment permit, which they would, as part of their review process, um, should we be putting sidewalks in that would be under their their purview assuming that you guys have your regulation for the sidewalks to be installed they would have to review it from i guess a design standpoint and ultimately approve it as part of our encroachment permit application because here everything's on um dot right of way there's a decent gap between our property line and the edge of the road here right right and, and i'm not saying see, it, it's hard to tell but i think up in this area yeah, there we go this is the area in particular that I was referring to where there's wetlands that extend right up to the edge of the roadway here, which that then opens up um, more significant issues with regards to, to permitting through DOT and potentially Army Corps if you're crossing or spanning a wetland, you know, that's 80 or 90 feet just to put in a, a public sidewalk. Um, that, that's where the tricky part will come down if, if we ultimately end up doing that side there. I no wetlands on this side of the road or on the east side here. But as you can see, there are no sidewalks in this aerial anyways, all the way as far as you can see. And I don't think it's till you get to that the shopping center up here on the right that there's the first sidewalk on the northern side of the site. Um, but yeah, so that just kind of shows you a big picture of what we were dealing with here from, from a, a site standpoint and the constraints that we were dealt. Jeff, absolutely. I understand what you're saying. All I'm saying is the current regulations say Understood. either they're on the plan or you have to have a waiver. So I would right. hate for, you know, something to come back that it's an incomplete application. So, you know, putting the sidewalks, you know, as a condition of approval right now until you come in for a waiver. And then at that time, if the commission agrees to a waiver, then they're removed. But if they don't, agreed to the waiver, then something's going to have to be done. But right now, um, sidewalks have to be put in due to our regulations without having a waiver present to be heard. 
That's all. Did he freeze up again? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you want to say something, Jeff? Because you froze up again. I just said thank you very much. No problem. Any other commissioner's comments before I open this up to the public? Yes, I have one. That's why I had my hand up. Oh, sorry, Charlie. Go ahead. Okay. We, uh, as far as, I had a statement, actually. And as far as that extra road, public safety used to always be on us about it because when they come to a an incident at a place like this, you usually end up with six to eight units in there, and there's absolutely no way to get out for anybody unless there is a secondary outlet. You get like a couple of a unit that's big. You're not going to have one fire truck and one police car and one ambulance. You're going to have a bunch of them and end up with the whole parking lot jammed up with public safety vehicles as well as the ones that are there. That's why they wanted the second exit. Okay. Historically, that was been the reason. Okay. And uh, I just curious about the door sizes. I'm sure they all be. Uh, ADA approved as far as inside for the wheelchairs and stuff like that. Yeah. Correct. Yes. From a okay, thank you. Well. Those That's are my all? only two statements. That's it. Okay. Thanks, Commissioner Ladd. Any other commissioners before I open it to the public? Okay, seeing none, at this time I'd like to open public hearing 2980 118 Hazard Avenue to the public. Please state your name and address for the record. We will do a three min minute timeline and we will allow you to come up three separate times and then give the applicant a chance to um, uh, answer your concerns and questions if possible. And then I will open it back up to the public. Anyone in the public wishing to speak, please speak, say, speak up. Mr. Chairman, this is Lori Witten speaking. Go ahead, Lori. Um, I just want to clarify that this is the public hearing for the application and not necessarily for the intervener. We will get to that as soon as we're done with the public hearing for the actual application. Okay. Is there anyone out there who would like to speak in favor or against public hearing 2980? If so, please speak up for the first time. Going for the second time. Um, I don't see any hands up and going for the third time. Okay, hearing none and seeing no hands raised, um, <clears throat> I will bring this back to the commission or the applicant, nothing. Okay, Lori, at this point, do we close the public hearing and open it to the intervener status or do oh, we keep no, the no, public no. hearing? So, uh, Mr. Chairman, we would uh, keep the public hearing open yeah. And we just, um, I, I will read the notice of intervention or if you, okay. if somebody else wants to read it into the record, that's, that's fine too. And then we could uh, go through that process and then the public hearing can still be continued, you know, yep. be maintained. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead and uh, read it into the record, please. Okay. Uh, this is to the Enfield Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, regarding public hearing 2980, uh, public hearing on a two-story 29,000 square foot assisted living facility with associated improvements on property located at 118 Hazard Avenue, map 65, lot 59, zone R44 by Ward Manor LLC, owner and Kaplan Development Group LLC applicant. And this is a notice of intervention. Uh, Richard Smura intervenes in this matter pursuant to General Statutes 22A-19 and states that Richard Smura is an individual who resides at 25 Middle Road, Enfield, Connecticut, 06082. Richard Smura is authorized by General Statutes 22A-19A to intervene as a party in this proceeding on the filing of a verified pleading which statute states in relevant part in any administrative licensing or or other proceeding 
and in any judicial review thereof made available by law, the attorney general, any political subdivision of the state, any instrumentality or agency of the state, or of a political subdivision thereof, any person, partnership, corporation, association, organization, or other legal entity may intervene as a party on the filing of a verified pleading no. asserting that the proceeding or action for judicial review involves conduct which has or which is reasonably likely to have the effect of unreasonably polluting, impairing, or destroying the public trust in the air, water, or other natural resource of the state. The applicant has filed an application for a two-story, 29,000 square foot assisted living facility, building and related site work on property located between Hazard Avenue and Middle Road, AKA 118 Hazard Avenue, map 65, lot 59, zoned R44, which is actually incorrect. It's a BP zone. Uh, this proceeding involves conduct which has or which is reasonably likely to have the effect of reasonably polluting, impairing, or destroying the public trust in the air, water, or other natural resources of the state by and including, but not limited to, the following. Distur um, A. Disturbing and altering the indigenous character of the land through removal of over three acres of forest that provides cooling, aesthetics, and air quality benefits to the community for the construction of a roadway, buildings, and parking areas. This will alter water flow into adjacent naturally vegetated and farmland areas and poses a risk of flooding on nearby roads. B, removing over three acres of tree cover with only 22 full-size trees to be planted will result in wetter conditions on the site because trees take up substantial <coughs> groundwater, transpire large volumes of water vapor, and because foliage intercepts much rainfall that evaporates before reaching the ground. C, over 75% of the facility footprint now drains northerly and easterly. Post-construction more flow will be directed westerly and southerly, placing farmland and wetland vegetation at risk along Hazard Avenue, AKA Route 190, identified on the town wetlands map and in a prior application. D, Three subsurface detention basins will discharge toward, towards forested wetlands and farming areas. The altered hydrologic regime is reasonably likely to raise the water table, which may stress or kill trees and other vegetation and render the northern low elevation portion of the farm field non-viable where water table elevation is already borderline. Uh, re, uh, e, removing a significant forested buffer with over three acres of vegetation cover will increase human exposure to air pollution and will significantly increase the amount of air pollution from busy Hazard Avenue that reaches nearby agricultural land and crops, including food grown for human consumption. Trees take up air pollutants through their stomata, breathing pores, and their foliage and bark intercepts airborne particulate pollution. Ambient cooling by trees decreases the ozone formation. F, the five proposed underground storm septic systems are geared to prevent flooding and remove coarse and medium sediment rather than to treat dissolved pollutants and very fine particles with the adsorbed toxicants. Contaminant stormwater discharge will come in contact with groundwater on the large adjacent onsite wetlands or after discharge towards Hazard Avenue because very low levels of PPBs, of roadway hydrocarbons, PAHs, are carcinogenic. This poses a health risk for humans and wildlife. The plan as proposed will create vehicle noise, emissions, and pollution that will negatively impact farmland, wildlife, vegetation, crops, and food produce grown for consumption. Uh, inter signed by intervener David A. Barham, Esquire of Barham, Tapper, and Gans, LLC, his attorneys. So I think at this point, Mr. Chairman, um, it would be the intervener's presentation to the commission and then there could be back and forth between the intervener and the um, applicant. Yep. Sounds good to me. That. Is the intervener present? Yeah. So could everybody please mute your mics if you're not speaking? There's been quite a bit of feedback.
Is the intervener present? Attorney Barham, I've just unmuted you. Can you, we're not hearing you though. Yes, can you, can you hear me? There now? we go. Now we oh. can hear you, sir. Thank, thank you. I had a little bit of technical, technological uh, issues. I'm on the computer, but I'm also on the phone. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, I'm attorney David Barham. I represent uh, the intervener, Nora, who is an adjacent property owner as well. And as a uh, Lori indicated uh, our notice of intervention, which we uh, read into the record, uh, I believe gives us status to participate as a full party uh, under the state statute that, that allows uh, for such for environmental reasons. It is not our intent to address wetland issues, but we do intend to address issues that are within the jurisdiction uh, of the zoning board, uh, especially things like uh, drainage, uh, pollution, uh, stormwater runoff, uh, all of those contained in section seven of your regulation. Uh, it also addressed issues regarding the site plan and the special uh, permit in section nine of your regulation. Um, I would like to begin, first of all, by making a couple of comments about the application itself. And uh, I want to preface my comments by indicating that the intervener is not against or opposed this project. We just feel that the stormwater management and the impact as designed will be deleterious to the vegetation and the um, environment, and that there are major improvements that can be made. I also want to uh, indicate that uh, for the hearing that was scheduled in July, we, we filed some uh, requests or pleadings, if you will, to uh, indicate that we felt the application was defective and needed to be renoted. And uh, Lori, uh, to her credit, uh, acknowledged that there were some issues and it was rescheduled uh, for tonight. But I still think that the application is defective. And I would like to explain uh, briefly why, uh, especially for purposes of uh, court appeal, if that should become necessary. And I thank you for your indulgence uh, in just giving me a moment to explain why I think this hearing should be continued and why it would be inappropriate to uh, act on it tonight. Uh, first of all, the agenda for tonight uh, indicates only the site plan review, whereas your advertisement, which initially was for site plan review, was changed to special permit. And the website material only talks about site plan review. And the application itself only checks off site plan review. There's nothing checked off about a special permit. Your regulations are pretty exact in 9.10.2 when it indicates that the site plan, if a special permit is required, uh, that is necessary. And under 9.20.2a, it, it also indicates that a site plan is an integral part of a special permit. I know in many other towns that I have uh, conducted zoning hearings, uh, the commission will normally uh, notice both the special permit and the site plan review. But in this case, no site plan was review was noticed uh, in the most recent notice. And in the agenda, it only talks about a site plan review and no special permit. So not to confuse you, but I believe that the notice for tonight is defective. Secondly, there's a letter that's on record. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I don't know. Uh, 
secondly, there's a letter that Barnard wants the applicant to proceed on their behalf tonight. But the letter of authorization uh, indicates that the property owner is the Senior Housing Development LLC, whereas in the uh, in the application uh, and in other materials, it indicates that the owner is the Ward Manor LLC. So the application is further discussed that says the owner is correctly identified. Um, Secondly, the application itself does not check off. Excuse me, Mr. Barron. I'm yeah. sorry, this is Lori. I, I personally can't hardly hear you, and I have my um, recording up at, at the highest level. Is it possible you speak a little more clear into the maybe, microphone? Maybe, maybe. If I, can you hear me better now if I speak up to the speaker, yeah. the phone? Not much. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know I can make it louder, but just to continue, the application itself does not check That's off better. The, uh, the special permit. It only checks off site plan review. So very similar to what the chairman was arguing a moment ago, where he said the sidewalk waiver was never requested. This application never requested a review of a special permit. And in a moment, I'll explain that your regulations require special permit approval for an assisted living facility. The next item is that an assisted living facility is far different than a memory care facility. A memory care facility is more akin to skilled nursing and in the presentation, the applicant indicated that it will be a secure facility, have its own kitchen facility, uh, have its own security system. The people there will not be driving cars. And again, memory care in most towns requires a separate application and permit. And in this case, not only your regulations not permit as far as I can tell a memory care facility, but the applicant has sought no variance and they have sought no test change to your regulations. So because of notice problems, uh, in misinformation about who the owner is, an application that does not ask for review of special permit and to include 13 or so units for memory care certainly makes this application tonight uh, defective and uh, I believe that the commission is not able to really go forward with this application because of all the defects that exist. Um, with that, unless the commission decides to continue the hearing at this point and uh, or table it or, or dismiss the application, um, I will proceed with my um, presentation on the substance, but I would just ask the commission whether or not at this point before taking the time to hear our full presentation, if the commission would decide that the application is defective and either should be dismissed or tabled. Well, um, Mr. Chairman and, and uh, Councilor, um, the special permit was required was checked off on the application. I guess we failed to put that back up on the uh, uh, on the post on the web. Um, the public hearing notification in the paper, the legal notice calls out the 118 Hazard Avenue as a special permit application. Um, you're correct. It should have said that on the um, agenda. However, it 
was in the legal notice and it is shown as a public hearing. And the memory care is an accessory use as far as um, assisted living facilities. Per 4.40, um, hold on, I gotta find it. Um, the development shall contain appropriate accessory uses as determined by the commission. So they can determine this to be an accessory use. I know that a lot of assisted facilities, assisted living facilities do have some memory care component to them. So, so I, I, would, I, would, I would just respond as follows, that the application that I have in my package and the application that existed as of yesterday I did not have any. the special permit checked off. Maybe it was checked off today, but I would say that that's too late. Uh, it was term, checked off only, for staff. Sorry. Okay, it's not on the application that's on the um, and it's not on the application that was sent to me uh, by staff. The owner of the property is misstated. The um, advertisement is at best confusing but probably void as a matter of law. And while I would uh, concur that memory care might be considered an accessory use, um, the applicant never asked that a finding be made uh, that it be yeah. made as an accessory use. In fact, the only place it was mentioned was on the floor plan uh, that could easily have been overlooked but there was nothing in the application that indicated they were seeking an accessory use. Uh, and to me, that you know, could be viewed as misleading um, because it was never requested that a finding be made as an accessory use. So I, I will, whatever the commission's pleasure is, if you want me to continue with our presentation, I will. But I just point out that I do feel this application is defective. Well, I, I first of all will say, but if we do continue, you're going to have to do something about your uh, microphone because none of us can hear you. And I mean, I'm hearing every third word that you say barely, and you're not getting your message across. I'm telling you that. So. Um, I see you're on a landline. I don't understand what's going on. Well, some like something something happened with the microphone here, and I'm not exactly sure what it is. See, I can even when you just said that, I can hear you better. So maybe if you hold the phone closer to your mouth or something, I just don't sure. want to miss what you're saying. Sure. Sure. Can you hear me now? I can hear you better, but not. Okay. My, my apologies. I, I've been on a number of Zoom meetings and I've not had this problem before. And I apologize. I just don't know what, what happened. <laughs> if you like, I can just briefly repeat what I just said. If that no, we, I, I think we got what you said. But before you continue on, if that's how we choose to go, it's just, you really need to speak into that telephone, speak louder or something um, so people can hear exactly what you're saying. Uh, the only thing I can think of is if you'd like to give me a moment, I can try using my, my cell phone and see if that makes a difference. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if you think that might help. Because Mr. Chair, go ahead, Mr. Commissioner Suzak. Because I, I guess from what I'm hearing is that you know there's a potential we have a technical deficiency in in our agenda and I guess and in, in the way we advertise everything, and that you know it would be you know irresponsible for us not to rectify that that situation prior to continuing, and if we have to continue the hearing to our next meeting. Would it be beneficial for us to re-advertise it and actually get all our technicalities 
in in place and, and i guess there's there's some discussion about the the, the applicant or the, the applicant's name definition is, is might have been different than in in one section than in the other section so that you know if we can rectify these conditions so that we don't lose everything that we've done you know in in our earlier meeting by continuing our application to the next meeting re-advertising it correctly and getting all our i's dotted and our t's crossed it, it might be beneficial for us to you know continue it and this way if we get you know a, a better connection at our next meeting or if we can meet you know in face to face at our next meeting which would be even better then you know we wouldn't have these technical difficulties but you know like you said you know i i'm not sure that that we we should listen to you know an, a, you know another hour an hour and a half of you know the presentation from the intervener and then have to you know get thrown out on the technicality you know so in that sense you know i i think it might be prudent for us to rectify some of these deficiencies and before we carry on so that we don't have a problem from a technical viewpoint I hear you loud and clear, and I would tend to agree with you. But before I do, I would like to hear what um, Lori has to say. So I, the, the, the legal notice is absolutely correct. There is no question about it. It says special permit. Um, the, so I think from that respect, I, you know, I think the fact that it was um, listed um, as a site plan, but also a public hearing on, on the agenda is not proper, but I don't think it's necessarily a fatal flaw. Um, I, I don't understand what the issue is with the name of the company. I'm not sure what that's all about. I, I still don't understand what that is. And, and they did agree that I could change the uh, um, application to show that they were applying for an, uh, they checked off the box for the person for them. So, Dave, Dave, uh, can uh, you address the name? Can, sure. sure. Uh, can, can you hear me now? I'm using my cell phone. Oh my God. I, I can hear you, I can hear you a lot off. better, but there's a lot of reverb. Okay, I'm sorry, sorry about that. Yeah. Where, 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 where the your uh, your computer uh, microphone. Uh, Thanks, John. Okay, can you can you hear me now better? Oh my God, yeah. so much better, so yeah. much better. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, okay. sorry about I, that. No, my my apologies, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, with regard to the to the name. Um, your regulations indicate that the application has to be signed by both the applicant and the property owner. And the property owner sent a letter authorizing the uh, applicant to make the presentation and sign the application. The problem is, is that the letter is, is by a, a company called Senior Housing Development LLC. But on the plans, and uh, according to other documents on record, the owner is stated as Ward Manor LLC. So there's confusion about who the owner is. And while it may seem somewhat uh, trite or insignificant, uh, the purpose is to allow members of the public to know who their owner is, to make sure there's no conflict of interest when a commissioner is sitting on an application that they don't um, have a relationship with the true property owner. And we don't really know who the property owner is because the letter again says senior housing development LLC, but the other documents indicate it's owned by Ward Manor LLC. And I could, I could correct that a bit here. Um, so basically the Ward Manor LLC is the owner of the property now. And the letter that they're providing was for us to have permission to come forward with the application, just letting us know as the commission that they're aware of the application. So Ward Manor is the current owner and they gave permission to Senior Housing Department LLC 
which I guess in turn, given the fact that the application reads Kaplan development, they're one of the same. So that's what the intent of that authorization letter was. It was to just let the, the current owner make the commission aware that, that this application was coming forth. So just to clarify what that letter was. Right. I would just point out that the letter, the letter uses Senior Housing Development LLC uh, as the uh, as the owner. Uh, again, I, I I I'm just pointing out that this application has so many uh, legal difficulties uh, between not checking off special permit, uh, not having the right owner, or at least confusing uh, the public as to who the owner is. Um, also, the agenda notice differs from the legal ad notice, which differs from the website materials, uh, which gives its own notice. Uh, and there is no specific request for an accessory use of memory care. It was just identified in the floor plans but I couldn't find any commentary anywhere else in the application that asked that the commission make a finding that it be an accessory use because in your regulations, when I look at the two uh, tables uh, for both the R44 and the BP zone, um, only an assisted living uh, care facility is listed. Um, there's there's nothing about a, a memory center, which again most people would agree is is closer to a skilled care facility, because most of these uh, individuals in memory centers have cognitive uh, deficiencies, uh, you know, like dementia, and uh, they need round the clock care and staffing. So, again. I, I just just like the chairman pointed out at the beginning of the meeting that no waiver had been filed for a sidewalk. I just think that the application has so many mistakes that it really should be deemed defective. And the applicant, I, I think, personally should start over again. But at the very least, by continuing it and having a new application filed and corrected and a, a new notice, I think it would um, it would be more appropriate. Can I just say something in regards to the memory care and um, nursing or skilled nursing component? You know that from from our expertise and what we've seen in other municipalities. Um, again, this is Ben Wells from the uh, applicant, but you know that's factually incorrect. I mean, we're a different licensure from the state. We are not a medical model. We're more of a um, social model that provides levels of care and some care, but we can't even provide the care under our licensure that a nursing home can. Um, it is very common to find a continuum of care in our industry where you have independent living, assisted living, and memory care all under one roof. It is not common to have skilled nursing in the same unit or building with other levels of care um, and we, under the code, uh, you know, we're not, we're not an institutional building, um, under the code where we're providing a medical model. Ben, can I expand on that a little bit? This is Steve Humphreys, the architect. Um, so typically for a nurse, for a nursing home, it's a different type of facility. Um, you have residents that are confined to beds. Uh, they cannot evac self evacuate the building um, and the building is licensed as a nursing home. It's a totally different license, as Ben said, for assisted living by the building code. Uh, that includes assisted living and memory care. Memory care residents may be slow to evacuate, uh, but they can still evacuate, um, but they're not confined to beds. This is not a nursing home. Um, we do not have, you know, eight foot corridors and wide doors to move beds. So totally different building. Well, I would, I would just argue that the zoning requirement may be different than uh, the distinction you're making. Uh, the, you know, the testimony of the applicant was that this will be a secured facility. It will have its own kitchen. The residents 
uh, are not people who are capable of driving. Uh, they put up uh, some kind of protective wall or barrier uh, to make sure that nobody wanders off. Th these are individuals who need 24-7 uh, you know, assistance and observation. And I don't think by any stretch of the imagination that would be called assisted living. Uh, I'm, I'm, all, I, all I meant to say is it is much closer to a skilled nursing facility because, again, the security requirements are, are there, the independent uh, kitchen requirements are there, um, the fact that nobody uh, there has a car and can leave the premises. Uh, he never without... said that. They never, I've been at the same meeting you have, and no time in this meeting did they say the residents cannot have a car and cannot leave the facility. They said that in their typical model, most residents do not have a car is what they said. So if, if we're going to get technical, let's be exactly precise on what they said. Okay. And as far as the memory care unit, uh, Lori addressed that it's an accessory use. So I, I, uh, the permitting process, I understand your concerns there. I, I have nothing to say there, but let, let's call it like it is. Let's not put words in their mouth. They're not putting words in yours. So, you know, at no point did they say these residents are locked down and cannot leave the facility. You're trying to make it more of a prison than you are assisted living by what you're describing. And Mr. Well, Chairman, Lori Witten, just to clarify, um, under um, the assisted living facilities under section 4.40.1F, it states an assisted living facility may be a standalone facility or part of a continuing care facility. So it sounds like you could have either or or both based on our regulations. Thank you, Lori. And that's not how you interpret it, Dave? Yes, um, I, I looked at your definition of continuing care and um, I'm not arguing that an accessory use might not be a, a memory care facility. My argument is, is that they never asked for it. Nowhere in the application do they seek uh, a designation as an accessory use. The only time it came up and the only place I could find it was on the floor plan. And quite honestly, I caught it by surprise. I was looking at the floor plan and I saw some different colors and I looked down at the uh, chart and it said memory care, uh, 13 units. And that's the only way I found it. So I'm just saying similar to the chair's argument about the waiver of sidewalk, uh, if you're looking for an accessory use, you need to ask for that finding. It doesn't automatically happen. Uh, the, the commission typically needs to identify the accessory use and determine whether or not it's appropriate. And you, and you may, uh, I'm not arguing that it isn't. I'm just arguing that the application is missing a lot of information and that's just one of many things. I, I, I understand what you're saying, but you could also, how come you're not saying that the kitchen restaurant isn't an accessory use or the laundry facility is not an accessory use? Well, if you want to be candid about it, until tonight when I realized the importance of the kitchen facility as a separate unit to the memory care, um, my mind was thinking of that exactly, um, that that was never mentioned in the application either. Um, I know an assisted living facility, when you look at it, uh, Certainly a kitchen and a dining room are considered normal parts of that, uh, but there's a separate kitchen for the memory care. And perhaps they should have asked uh, if, if there's some designation that's required. Uh, obviously it's, it's most appropriate to have a separate kitchen in a memory care. And I know the institutions that I'm familiar with, uh, particularly in Bloomfield, uh, do have their own separate kitchen uh, and security. Uh, but when I heard that this evening, the same uh, thing occurred to me. Okay. 
Okay. So Lori, I would ask you at this time, um, how do you feel about Commissioner Suzak's, um, um, I don't want to say request, but his um, idea about tabling it, reposting it with the proper information in all areas. So at the next meeting, we can address it and we have eliminated all those concerns. As far as the accessory structure goes, I think you've addressed it, but I do know um, I have some serious issues. This will give them time to get either a waiver in place for the sidewalks and give them time, you know, either put it on a plan or get the waiver in place. And also I'd like to hear from the fire marshal about this. So I, I kind of tend to agree with Rich on tabling this to the next meeting because there's other issues other than the intervener that I would like to have addressed. Um, yeah, I am on mute. Okay. Um, no, I think that that's probably the safest course of action. Um, it's unfortunate that we can't hear all the intervener stuff so we could get that done, but we'll just have to do it again some other time. Well, I, I'm, just concerned. I'm just concerned we're going to hear all the intervener stuff and then they're going to try to derail the public mm -hmm. hearing as an illegal meeting. So let's make sure the meeting's 100% legal before yep. we go forward and then have to hear it all over again. I, of course. I, I apologize to the applicant, but I think the applicant would rather continue this, get it right, and move forward than going forward and having the whole thing squashed. Dave? I, uh, not Dave, I'm sorry. Jeff? Yeah, I, I would tend to agree with that. We don't want any hiccups on the back end of this, and, and from a, a town standpoint, and having it posted correctly makes sense. Right, and, and again, I apologize to you. Things happen. Um, we tried to get it through um, and rush it through so we could do the special meeting for you so we could hear it. And I am open to another special meeting in the amount of time it's going to take to post. So um, if Lori, you just, you know, maybe send an email out tomorrow, include the intervener on when we could have a special meeting to rehear this and continue the public hearing. If that's okay. how the commission wants to go. Yeah. But I am agreeing with Commissioner Suzak. I mean, it sounds like you all have uh, some more questions anyway, so it would probably have been continued regardless. Mm -hmm. Okay, I would ask, think, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Commissioner Alimo. Do you think it's beneficial if we listen to the intervener's entire no. presentation tonight? No, because if he no. derails the public hearing as an illegal meeting, what's the point? We could still continue it. Well, we're going to continue oh. it. But I we're think gonna, we're here because of a technical problem the first time. Isn't that correct? I, I understand that, but that's what the, that's how they're going to do this. They're going to try to do technical, and then they're going to get into their thing. You, you've just got to go with it. Let's make it right. Address the town's issues with this so it doesn't affect the applicant. I, I agree with both you and Commissioner Suzak, but where I'm, where I'm trying to get here is, is there more? I mean, are we going to keep doing this every three, every two weeks, have a special meeting? He's going to come up with another issue and we're going to have to put it off again. So is there more he would like to say to us? Well, he hasn't even gotten into his presentation yet. That's just, he's just going on technical, how it's an illegal meeting, Frank. So why I understand. do you want to continue an illegal meeting? Oh, I, I agree. I just. I thought it would be beneficial, um, you know, to go ahead and do what you and Commissioner Suzdak are saying, but to, if he has more for us, we could incorporate that as well. That's all I'm saying. No. I, I, I recommend that if we're going to continue this, we do it now. I mean, okay. we, we, we table this until the next possible meeting. Whether or not you want to have a special meeting or not is up to the commission. Well, that's why I said, Lori, see what it's going to take you to repost and get everything straight. Yeah. And then, you know, because, you know, it may end up being close to the end of August anyways, depending on what's on our agenda for the beginning of September. I mean, there's a lot of different things at play and only you can answer that. And I'm not going to ask mm -hmm. you for that tonight. 
you know, give you time to go to your office, get everything in order, because then you'll know when the allotted time and what's coming up. Yeah, a special meeting would be late, late uh, the week of the 17th or the 24th. Okay. Um, does the applicant have anything they'd like to add to this? Uh, you know, from our standpoint, there's, there's a lot of the, the technical issues that we've reviewed just with regards to stormwater and the environmental issues. We feel that we have adequately addressed. We've provided a very large buffer between the adjacent property and we've complied with all of the uh, stormwater regulations, erosion control guidelines, all the state and uh, town of Enfield regs. Um, I know we talked about the sidewalk waiver. Um, I'm coming back to that with the technicality and looking looking at what that would take. Um, but other than that, you know, we want to be a good neighbor to, to, to this gentleman on the west, west of us here. Um, but we tend to agree with you. We, we don't want this to get held up or them to deem this an illegal hearing um, right. over or a posting of an agenda um, that would just kick this out even further. Um, right. Two weeks could save you a year in court. If we can come to terms and, you know, work together. I mean, the facility you're building is beautiful. And I see the very large buffer between your property and his property. I understand his concerns and I do have several questions myself, but we will address them at that time. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Um, this is David Barrow. Um, I, I, I just want to say that, again, the intervener um, does not oppose this project. Uh, we think it's a beneficial project for the town as well. We just feel that some of the technical issues can be made better in terms of stormwater management. And we reached out to the applicant's attorney, uh, both in Connecticut and New York. Uh, I sent them a letter and I left telephone messages with no response. Now that I know some of the people who made the presentation tonight, it's my hope that we can contact them in the next week and see if perhaps we could share some of our thoughts with them. Just maybe they would uh, you know, consider and include some of our thoughts and ideas uh, in the plan, which would uh, make the next hearing a very quick hearing uh, if we could all come to agreement. Because our, our plan is not, not to stop or try and stop this project. It's really just to try improve some of the plans that they presented, which we think um, would require, you know, just some uh, fine tuning on their part and that we could have a harmonious uh, uh, supportive application by all parties. That sounds good to me. I mean, I'm sure if the applicant can work something out with you without going to extreme lengths, um, they'd be willing to do it too. They seem like they're a very good neighbor to have. I mean, there could be a lot more intense uses on this property that I, I would think that uh, your client would have much larger issues with um, as he's had issues with all the other surrounding properties in that area. So um, at, at this point, um, any other commissioner's comments? If not, I will entertain, go ahead, Charlie. I'm going to make a motion to continue this meeting to the week of the 24th. Maybe before we do that, could I have a, I have a comment in terms of, I did take a look there's at. A um, motion on, there's a motion on the table, Rich. You, Charlie would have to withdraw his motion. No, go ahead. You want us to go forward, Rich, or you want him to withdraw the motion? It, it doesn't matter. Well, we can address it the next meeting. It really doesn't matter. Well, it does matter. I'm trying to be technical. We already got one thing going on. Go I made ahead, the motion Charlie. because if I made the motion because if we're running an illegal meeting, we should just shut it down. I agree. And that's what Lori said. Uh, so there's a motion on the table. Chairman, this is Linda, and I second Charlie's motion. The motion's made and seconded. Any comments on the motion? Nope. Can I have roll call, please? Um Ken Nelson. Four. Linda the Gray. Four. Charlie Ladd. Four. Um John Petronella. Four. No, Frank Alimo. John's not seated. Oh, um, Frank Alimo. Four. 
Vinnie Grillo. Four. Richard Suzak is four and Ken Nelson. Four. You forgot you Ginny. Ginny. Oh, Ginny. <laughs> Ginny <Higgy>. Four. <laughs> And you, called me, and you called me twice, Rich, but that's okay. So motion, motion to um, continue to, to the week of the twenty fourth is unanimous. I apologize to the applicant, but I think in the end it's in everybody's best interest. And if if the um, intervener does reach out to you or your attorneys. Uh, it can't hurt to hear what they have to say before the next meeting and Agreed. maybe maybe work out some of these issues. And then hopefully at the next meeting, you guys come, you're holding hands and everybody's happy and we push this right through. All right. Enough. Moving on. Uh, flood permit. Uh, FDL number 41. Do you want to table this one, Lori? And she went home. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm still here. Um, no, there's there's nothing wrong with this application. Okay. Oh Jesus, I'm sorry. It's a I'm I see Hazard Avenue. Okay. Rich. Um, Ken Nelson. Here. Linda De Gray. Here. Charles Ladd. Here. Virginia Higley. Here. Frank Alimo. Here. Don Petronella. Here. Vinny Grillo. Here. And Richard Suzak is here. Okay, is there anybody here for the applicant? That was the uh, first applicant, and I think they signed off and uh, forgot yeah. that they're on for the second application. <laughs> <laughs> so. I Do figured we, somebody went home. <laughs> Do we need him for this application? Um, you already reviewed it, and he even did address some of the flood issues that um, existed on the property. We did um, give you a staff report as well. Um, basically, there is um, some compensatory storage, which is required. Um, and the proposed site plan creates approximately 1,165 CF of compensatory storage in underground 36 cubic diameter feet. piping. Yeah, cube, yeah, cubic feet. I, I was just reading. <laughs> um, and the um, the uh, uh, assistant town engineer um, did review the um, the flood application as well and had a few uh, couple small um, comments, which I think were also addressed under the uh, site plan review or the public hearing um, approval special permit. So um, if, you, if you have any questions, I uh, personally am not an engineer, but I can answer as best I can from the regulations and the information that we have. Commissioners? Looks like they did it all. <laughs> yeah, I think they addressed quite a bit of it when they spoke. Right. Yep. So it's up to the commission how you want to proceed. Make a move to accept FLD 41, 25 and 39 Hazard Avenue, an application for a permit for development within the special flood hazard area to allow excavation and limited fill in the AE zone. Paramount Nuco Realty owner applicant, map 045, lot, two, lot 0002. 0008 BR zone. Is there second. a second? Do we need it to get comments from the public? There's a public no. it's, not, it's not a public hearing. No. No. The flood permit. All right. Okay, motions made and seconded. Roll call, please. Linda de Gray. Four. Charles Ladd. Four. Virginia Higley. Four. Frank Alimo. Four. Denny Grillo. Four. Richard Suzak is four and Ken Nelson. It's unanimous. Motion passes. Anything else? No. Who got the second on that? I'm sorry, I just missed it. I, I believe it was Linda. Linda? All right. Sorry. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, I'll entertain a motion for adjournment. 
I make a motion that we adjourn. Motion is made by Linda, seconded by Jenny. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <laughs> Unanimous. Can Aye. I just ask a quick question? Do, is everybody available the week of the 24th? I mean, mm. are you on vacation <laughs> or? As far as I know. Which day? Well, Which day? Uh, just uh, any day. Just if I just in just general, the, are you all here? The 24th itself is not a good night for me. Right. I prefer okay, not Fridays. <laughs> yeah, no Friday. Not Monday, not Friday. No. Well, we'll try to do it Wednesday or Thursday of that week. How's that? Tuesday, okay. Wednesday, Thursday works for me. As yes. long as I don't have call. Oh, Wednesday's <laughs> out. I give Rich. I, oh, yeah. I won't let you down. Oh, right? yeah, Thursday. the golf thing. Tuesday, so Tuesday or Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. Okay. We, we will we will make it so. Have a good and, night. All right. Good night, sure everyone. Thank you. Talk soon. Bye. Night. Have a happy time. Bye. <laughs>